Hey. Hello. How's it going? It's okay. Oh my gosh, doing research for this one was fun because, <laughs> yeah, so um, we are starting Sea of Monsters um, mm -hmm. for our listeners. And I at least got to the first two chapters. I don't know how you far, how far you've gotten in your reread. I read the first three chapters, but it's not that much of a difference. The third chapter is them trying to get to camp. Yeah, so it's not really quite there in the action yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, all the action that happened in the second chapter anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but um, I kind of, I had some mom feels come up in that first chapter. <laughs> And it came up with Percy saying, um, like, how his mom could sense something was off. And she, like, kind of gets that it's a dream about something going on. And um, he's like, oh, me and my mom don't have to talk about that kind of stuff. She just knows. I can't tell you how many times William assumes I just know shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got a little triggered on Sally's behalf. I was like, no, she doesn't. She has no idea what you've been through, kid. <laughs> no, she she knows that something is wrong with him, but or like that he's worried about something, maybe. But yeah, at the yeah. part about that that I thought was interesting was how we discussed before about like, what does Sally know about his, there's no way that she actually knows what happens on his quest. Yeah, and yeah, that whole part like verifies that because He's like, no, I don't tell my mom anything about anything, anything <laughs> about like the Greek world. Not really. We don't really talk about that stuff, but she just can tell when I'm worried about it. And I like, like somebody, a friend of mine that I made from like the Percy Jackson videos, she said, she's like, I think that, um, what did she say? I think that the, the episode titles or like, not the episode titles, the chapter titles are what Percy tells Sally. And I'm like, that's, that's honestly probably what it is. Like, yeah. like he almost dies and does all this stuff. And he's like, oh, my teacher tried to eat me. Yep, I exploded the bathroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of course, like Ari, I threaten Aries because he threatens me and my friend's life. Oh, he bought us cheeseburgers. <laughs> like that's the important thing about that part of the story. It was oh definitely important to Grover. I like, I laugh whenever I think about this stuff because I just remember like me and um, my mom when I was a teenager, especially. <laughs> like she, like to this day now, she'll be like, what was actually happening? And I'm like, well, I could actually give you an answer now um, because she just genuinely <laughs> was just like, I'm just trying to keep up or like know anything at all about what I was doing. And I, I would do the exact same thing that Percy does with Sally. I would just be like, oh yeah, everything's great. Sure. Yeah. Everything's super. Uh, yeah. Definitely the most pressing thing about my life right now is how I befriended a homeless child at school. That's, that's the only thing that you need to know about me. Well, and then we also have the other side is that Sally knows something's happening at camp, but she doesn't tell him. Yes. That yeah. also, that bothered me of like the whole thing that, that Chiron told her what was going on, but she's like, oh, I don't want you to worry. So I'm just not going to tell you and make you worry about it and ruminate on it for the next eight hours. Exactly. <laughs> like that's, that's definitely what Percy needs is to yeah. not know what's going on. Um, we could talk about this later, I guess, because other plot things obviously happen, but um our whole like thing with harry potter last forever <laughs> about how i complain about it all the time yeah. and that the whole idea that like the second book starts off with oh camp is fucked up mm -hmm. like and he's like this is the one place i'm supposed to be safe and yeah. he literally thinks that like i'm supposed to be safe this is literally the only place in the entire galaxy that I, I'm supposed to be safe and you're telling me that something is wrong with camp. Like Annabeth is so worried about it that she like finds a way to get there from freaking California. Yeah. Um, and is like attacked by monsters the entire way <laughs> uh, to, but still has to get there because she's having dreams about camp being ruined. And it's, and it's just like, this is like the one place that they're supposed to be safe. And immediately in the first book, Luke is poisoning the thing that makes them safe. <laughs> 
Yeah. And then it's like immediately they go like right for the throat. And it just makes me remember how weak fucking bitches the Harry Potter kids are and how weak that world is because like nothing, nothing happens at school until like the last book, like the last book, they finally have a battle at school, which is like seen as such a big deal and i'm like this is book two they are 13 years old well, nothing that puts all of the kids well i don't know because i guess the bascal is but that wasn't everybody in danger it's like oh mm -hmm. just this one group of kids is in danger. yeah so it was never like everybody in the school was in danger all at once yeah like the scariest stuff is like oh the dementors showed up in when we were playing like our sport and yeah. And like, but they freak the fuck out so much about the Dementor showing up one time that they like, they don't let Harry go to like Hogsmeade because he doesn't have like somebody to sign his permission slip basically. Yeah. And so like they lock things down so hard when one thing happens and it's like in this world, Luke shows up and poisons the thing that makes them all safe, thereby making them unsafe. And Chiron is getting, is has been like kicked out of his position. <laughs> Like they find out about that once they get to camp in this book, but it's like immediately it's like Chiron isn't in charge anymore and he's the only person that we trust. Mm -hmm. Camp isn't safe anymore. So literally every single kid that is at camp is now in like mortal danger and we have to go and find this thing to like save them so they don't all die before we get back. Yeah. Like there is no, there's no like comparison to something like that in Harry Potter, I guess maybe in like the last battle, but it's still like a big battle. It's not like somebody is attacking the literal school and and they're just having to defend themselves. Like there's adults there that are helping them. Those kids don't, they don't have anybody. Like Dionysus is too drunk to care. <laughs> and, yeah, Dionysus is too drunk and Chiron has limited abilities. Like he's a great Chiron artist. can't be there because they kicked him out of his that's true they like kicked him out of his position and so he's not allowed to be there because people are getting paranoid about him because Kronos is his dad yeah um so it's like they just they don't think that he's sa a safe person to be at camp anymore and so he can't I don't remember where he is but he can't really be there either and so it's like they they get like a nice place to be in for one book and then immediately the beginning of the second one it's like never mind Yep. This is all getting fucked up for you now. <laughs> it's only you're you're a seventh grader, but already your like sense of like safety is already being threatened by the guy that you thought was a friend of yours until he tried to murder you in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess like the one similarity we have between this and the second Harry Potter book is that, you know, school is too dangerous for you, or your your magic place is too dangerous for you right now. Mm -hmm. But we have Percy being like, oh shit, what's going on? I want to help. And we have Harry being like, you can't keep me from magic school. That's the one place I like. Yeah. Like, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care if it's too dangerous right now, little elf child that is actually a slave. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going to like go there anyway. Like, I can't, it would honestly be a dangerous activity for anyone to try to tell Percy you're not allowed to go to camp. He'd be like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I'm going to go to camp right now just to spite you and blow up something in your face. Like, yeah. that would, that would, like, <laughs> never, he, he would immediately be like, what's going on? What's wrong with camp? Who died? Yeah, like, which is why Sally leaving him on that cliffhanger before school is so bad. Yes. Tell your child what's going on oh so they don't, because people literally die. Or at least don't do that. You know, at least yeah. don't like start the morning off with, oh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. And then <laughs> one thing that was uh, cute about that part was Annabeth being in his window mm -hmm. and him not realizing it at first. Um, yeah. That's like a recurring, somewhat recurring theme that she just kind of shows up at Percy's apartment sometimes invisible and it's just like, and just like walks into his room and it's like, what's up? I'm here <laughs> and it's like how can Sally really like stop that um and also it feels weird of like how can she really do that much when they're literally out there like fighting and trying to save the world can you really tell your teenage child that you're that his best friend that's a girl isn't allowed to come over whenever she wants oh my gosh yeah <laughs>
Like they've already been on an adventure together where they've had to like share tents and like, you know, cars and trains and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I also like how sweet it is that Percy is so worried about Grover. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like people downplay like how important Grover is for the whole Percy and about Grover trio and just how Grover is Percy's best friend. Yeah. And I feel like people forget about that because they focus so much on the romance stuff. Yeah. They just forget that no Grover is his best friend. Grover was friends with him before he even knew he was like who he was. Um, yeah. And it's and I love I always love that about Sea of Monsters that the thing that worries him and makes him need to figure out what's going on is that he got scared by having a bad dream about Grover being chased by something. And he's like, I have to go save my friend. Yeah. And I mean, there's something so pure about them having this link as best friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, I think that happens in this book where they, where they do the empathy link thing, um, mm -hmm. where Grover can like feel Percy's emotions, which like, <laughs> Yes. Oh my god <laughs> I, i'm thinking about the thing that people always bring up with that is the heroes of olympus books where percy just goes through the the fucking ringer in those but it's ridiculous the amount of things he goes through in those books and um it's just like percy gets traumatized extensively let's just let's fucking go that's the only thing that happens in those books when it comes to percy and so it's wild to think that grover isn't around for a lot of those books but he's definitely feeling everything that Percy's going through, and he must just be like, "What the fuck is, what the fuck is going on?" Um, with like all the things that he would be feeling from him, but it's still there. Like it, even in like the last book that just came out last year, he still has like that whole empathy link thing, and I love that they still have that, and mm -hmm. that both of them want like want it. Like by the time the books are coming out now, are like Percy's like eighteen. They don't necessarily need it in the same way, but they just want it because they're best friends. Why would you not want to be able to feel how your best friend is doing without actually having to talk to them? Yeah, and I mean, I, th I feel like I've had friendships like that in real life where it's like, I just have a feeling that I need to like text them or go find them or something like that. I love it because I do that with you sometimes and it's really funny. Like <laughs> I remember a couple, a couple weeks ago, all of a sudden I just got this feeling. I was like, I should send Mandy like a motivational, happy, like <laughs> reel on Instagram. And I'm like, why do I want to do this suddenly? And I just like, and I sent it to you. And literally right after I sent it to you, I saw like a post you made where you were sad about something. And I was <laughs> like, I swear, I didn't see that before I sent that to you. I just, for some reason was like, Mandy's probably sad today. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know why I, why I, why I did that. It just happens like that sometimes and it would be helpful honestly especially i like i think i like the empathy link a lot because if you lived in like a if you were in like a magical world like this where that existed and your best friend was percy jackson <laughs> and was like always in the middle of everything and people are constantly putting him in the middle of these horrible situations yeah. I would also want to have something there where I could check on him to make sure he's still alive and yeah. that he's okay. Um, so that if he's not okay, I could contact him and talk to him and ask him what's going on. Um, that just makes sense. Like if, if I was in danger, like, or if I had somebody who could be in danger, I would want to make sure that they were okay by yeah. having something like that. That's not like a creepy, like the creepy way, I guess, like in Harry Potter with the map. The, yeah. the martyr or oh, the, map. the map or whatever the that um that james and all those people make up yeah. um because that map is kind of it's it's like a good idea but it's also creepy at the same time and could be used very badly against them and i'm pretty sure at some point it does i just remember um harry using that freaking map to just like watch Ginny walk around in circles when she was at school when they were in the tent and I'm like this is a little bit weird that you're just like spying on your ex-girlfriend because you're like lonely and don't know what else to do when you're in the middle of this war and can't talk to anybody um, but I'm just like this is kind of strange um 
but yeah, it's it's a much better way to do that because there's no no one can ever take advantage of that necessarily in the same way. So it's just purely just something for them to feel comforted by. Well, I mean, like a modern day equivalent, I guess, and a technological equivalent rather than magical is sharing your location with somebody because that's kind of like that's the best we can do, you know, is like look at each other's stories on social media, couple that with locations and then be like, oh, shoot, maybe I should check on this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, mythologically, I feel like they right away tell us that this is about the Odyssey pretty quickly. Um, so in the dream where Grover is running away, they don't say that it's a Cyclops that is following him, but it's it's almost clear to me in the sense that like the way that he describes the smell that like mm -hmm. there's a smell of blood and meat and stuff and um it it does bring up that picture of the cyclops who's kind of like a shepherd and and eats odysseus's men like that um but of course the other the other hint we get is like honestly one of the most devastating monsters from the odyssey which is the lystragonians um so the chapter two is the dodgeball game, yeah, which is a creative way to do it. So the story with the Lystragonians, it's like double devastating because something devastating happened before that. Um, Aeolus, the god of winds, gave them like a special bag and he had tied up all of the other winds except for the one that would direct them towards Ithaca, Odysseus's home. Mm -hmm. And so all of the other winds were packaged up in this bag and you know, it was like, release them when you get home kind of thing. And the men all of a sudden decide, oh, Odysseus is hiding something from us because for whatever reason, he doesn't tell them what it is. And they're like, there must be some sort of treasure in here from Aeolus. Let's look in the inside, which blows them back. He has to have this embarrassing conversation with Aeolus where he's like, I think you're screwed because like that happening means some God's mad at you. So like, <laughs> bye. Um, and uh, then they get to the Lystragonians. When they get there, they have 12 ships. They leave with one, like um, it's that bad. So they land on the island, he sends some messengers and they go and meet the king. And the king immediately eats one of the three men that's there. So the <laughs> other two run and scamper back and they had all parked their ships in this cove except for Odysseus and the cove was surrounded by cliffs. So these giant, people are then hauling rocks at their ships that are down on the cliffs. And since Odysseus wasn't parked there, he just cuts his losses and leaves. And the rest of the ships get massacred. Like they, they talk about the Lystragonians like spearing them like fish to take back home to eat. So it's like, it's really, really devastating. You think he lost 11 ships of men and, um, so the fact that that's the very first monster, like, mm -hmm. looks pretty intense. And the fact that Tyson takes them on on his own, um, like, pretty much, yeah. The one thing with Percy Jackson world that I think is really funny is that they call the Lastragonians, because it's hard to pronounce, mm -hmm. they call them Canadians. <laughs> And it's like a thing in all of the books. And it re reading this reminded me, there's this really funny scene in the Heroes of Olympus books when Percy has the one when he has amnesia. Mm -hmm. One of the kids that are with him is actually, actually Canadian. <laughs> Frank oh is gosh. actually Canadian. And, you know, Percy has amnesia. He doesn't really remember that much. And they run into the, them when he has amnesia. And, they're, and the kids like Hazel and Frank don't haven't are they're still like babies like they haven't really seen a lot of monsters so they're like what the hell are those things and Percy with amnesia oh they're Canadian well they're Canadians and actual Frank an actual Canadian is like excuse me <laughs> I was just like this is wonderful <laughs> that he, when he has amnesia he remembers that they're called Canadians and nothing else. He doesn't actually know what they really are. He just knows that they're called that. And I'm like, that's, thank you, Rick Riordan for that because that made me laugh remembering that scene. <laughs> yeah, and they're actually his half brothers, by the way, which is uh, sometimes Rick nods towards those things and sometimes he doesn't, he doesn't mention it here, but um, they are children of Poseidon. 
So that was also interesting. But I thought the dodgeball angle, like yeah. taking that hurling rocks at the ships and turning that into dodgeball was a pretty cool idea. I like that too. And I, I just, it was also just like a good kind of scary thing to start with, like the idea of them in like gym class where he can't have his weapon with him, even yeah. if he wanted to, because they can't when you're in gym class, you have to wear stupid clothes <laughs> when you're in gym. And so he doesn't have it with him. And so he's literally just like cornered and can't get away or do anything. Um, I always love whenever Annabeth like surprises people with being invisible where they're like, what the heck is, what, who's, what, who, like nothing just stabbed me. <laughs> and she's like, hi, I am here. I've been stalking you all day, but you won't like the, the part before that, that I thought was funny, which shows like Percy's Percyness is that when he's in the hallway and he he hears Annabeth say his name and he's like, there's no way a girl would ever be talking to me. Oh my gosh, yeah, that made me laugh so hard. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, I know that exact feeling of like nobody likes me. Mm -hmm. Like nobody wants to talk to me. There's absolutely no way a girl is actually wanting to talk to me right now. So obviously I'm hallucinating and I'm just hearing things. So I'm just gonna keep going on with my life. <laughs> Yeah, it was so funny to read that. <laughs> Other thing that stuck out to me was like the whole thing with Percy and Tyson. And when you think about his friendship with Grover too, yeah. Percy's got the thing like me for the underdog. He's like, yeah. I, everybody isn't noticing this person in the way they should. So I'm taking them under my wing. I love, I love Tyson so much because the whole thing on the show where they're like monsters don't always look like monsters is so like a personification of that is tyson where he's like a cyclops or whatever but he is like the sweetest most precious child like the first time you ever hear about him is is um sally telling percy to go and meet him because he's scared of going on the underground subway by himself yeah. and that he like cries at school when people are mean to him so percy gives him like a peanut butter sandwich and to make him feel better and yeah. and just like it, I don't know, like, we obviously don't know, like, and I don't know if anyone would ask Rick things like this, like, what he, like, based, like, Tyson's kind of, like, innocent or, like, I don't know, stuff on, like, how he acts, like, how sweet he is, but at least for me, being an autistic person, it reminds me of autistic people sometimes, of how, like, being afraid of going underground by yourself being like overwhelmed by people at school, being mean to you, not knowing how to handle just like normal things and kind of needing somebody like someone else, like Percy to be around to just kind of help you out and protect you when people are being mean, where you just sit there and cry, even though you're a cyclops and you could easily kill all of them. You don't want, he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to hurt anybody, yeah. but I don't know if that was what he was going for or not, but I liked, <laughs> I liked it because it reminded me of a lot of autistic people, especially autistic kids, but really any autistic people when we're not like masking or like pretending like we're fine. That's kind of what we're like on the inside where we just want to like cry because we're overwhelmed by like simple <laughs> things. And so I found that I liked that, like reading that this time because I definitely didn't know that I was autistic the first time I read these books. And I was like, oh, that's very, it's very sweet either way, how he like frames somebody like Tyson, like the, the I saw, I found like a, a free like PDF of CF Monsters that I'm reading it on because I don't have any money. And so I, in that PDF version, they have like the original dialogue where the kid that's the big um, rich bully well, uh, calls per, uh, not Percy, calls Tyson the arsler. Mm -hmm. And Percy just gets so mad at him, especially for that. And it's like, he is not that. He is like a good kid and get the, and like threatens basically to like fight, like stops himself from actually fighting him. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's really good to have in a kids-ish book, to have something like that out there to tell them like, no, don't say that word. Don't talk, don't treat kids this way. Because Tyson yeah. is like a million kids that I can remember going to school with. Yeah. 
he's just kind of like forgotten and um I mean, the mist makes it even more sad because the mist prevents him from being helped at all. Like we we hear that Sally's called social services, but for whatever reason, they can't see past the mist enough to even find him. Like mm -hmm. his his whole refrigerator box that he sleeps in is not there for them. Yeah. And it's it's also like a thing of this like super like rich school with like really rich like kids that are seen as like you know troublesome probably like rich kids go to going to a school like this mm -hmm. just so they can graduate that they ad like adopt somebody like tyson um pure because to try to make it look like they're nice people um <laughs> it just reminds me of a lot of people i knew at school that would do things like that of acting like oh we're nice see we're helpful we're helping the community we're adopting this like homeless child but also he's relentlessly bullied the entire time he's at school and person he doesn't have any friends because he's nice to tyson and they literally tell him in front of tyson if you weren't friends with him we would be friends with you or you would have more friends percy doesn't care because he's a nice he's a good person but mm -hmm. but like the part that like killed me was at like the end ish of when they're at school before everything happens at in gym that tyson is like sitting there crying being like I don't know what's going to happen to me next year if you're not here because whether the school pretends like they're nice or not like he, percy's the only reason he made it through that school year because yeah. he like basically is like his little bodyguard and if percy's not there he's definitely not going to last and the school might not even bring him back next year <laughs> and yeah. it's just like that whole horrible thing of jesus christ <laughs> this is like a homeless child and the school just doesn't doesn't actually care <laughs> Yeah, it's like, um, not only do, the school doesn't care about anything. I, I t told you, like, I was getting the vibe that Rick's mad at some sort of education system. <laughs> yeah. Because, like, the teachers are negligent on purpose. And, and mm -hmm. like, every single test that they do. So the English teacher saying, oh, we're going to talk about Lord of the Flies. So let's go outside and all you guys bully each other. <laughs> and, like, um, it's a great idea what was it it was like a first one to make an explosion i majored in chemistry for a short while and what <laughs> made me stop was this one experiment where we had to do it under something called a fume hood because like when you pour these two chemicals together the gas that it lets off is toxic and so you have to do the entire thing under this like vented area and i remember being like oh sh this is really scary i don't like this Mm -hmm. And so the fact that there's just a teacher like, hey, here's a bunch of chemicals, have fun, whoever makes something explode wins. God. Yeah. And then it reminds, that whole thing just reminds me of some of the rich kids I went to school with. Like, mm -hmm. um, my school is, my high school especially, was very, um, very rich. <laughs> and it, it was very academically driven too but so there was that but there's this one um guy who was our football coach for a long time like he died actually two years ago and my sister and i were like i'm not sad that he's dead. <laughs> but he was kind of a he was kind of a weirdo but I'll, I'll tell the story but they like named like the football field at my high school after him and everything he was the football team at my high school literally like basically runs like literally everything okay. and um and it, so when he was he was a gym teacher mm -hmm. in quotation marks because did he teach anything no and um his like gym class was called my high school name um club mm -hmm. and so you would basically just go to the gym area where there was like a room where there was like a bunch of workout equipment that I'm sure like the athletes on all the different sports teams use to like work out and lift weights and do those things that athletes have to do during practices and stuff. And the entire class was you just like working out. You didn't have to do anything. You didn't even have to play a sport. You like my sister took it one one year. Like everyone knew that it was the easiest class in the entire world that if you just like showed up, you would get an A because he doesn't actually care she took it one of one of the years she was in school because it worked with her schedule and all of the football players that were in that class would 
be able to just not do anything mm-hmm. like for like like he would just be like oh you have it we have a game on friday so you can just like rest the entire week and that is actually like against our school rules like one of the school rules they would go through in gym class is that in normal gym class it's not run by this guy is that you even if you were an athlete on like a school team and you had like meets or whatever coming up you still had to contribute and actually do gym class and and do all the sports that you're supposed to do because you're supposed to be a normal student and actually like contribute like everyone else does but with this guy he just like let them all do nothing and would just give them aid uh aid aid. someone at my door hold on okay Uh, me and Jake have been switching off cars, so he didn't have his house key. Hmm. What was I going to say? Oh, yeah, that because this guy, he just like let them do whatever they wanted and yeah. didn't make them do anything. And it was absolutely against school rules, but the school never did anything about it because the football team got all of all of the money. Yeah, like, they had, it, they, uh, my high school at the football team had um like fake astroturf mm-hmm. on like the football field like they do for like professional sports teams after they put that in after I graduated like we went me and my friends went back to look at it because we're like is this real they yeah. <laughs> literally put in astroturf at our high school but that's who uh that's what this school reminds me of of just everyone like that where the kids that go there are so rich that the that they just like shove them there and they mm-hmm. don't care about anything else they're doing which i don't know why i know this but i remember hearing about schools like this that actually exist on like the upper east side in like new york city that when there's like rich kids that don't want to follow the rules they just shove them in a school like this where they don't do any work at all and they still graduate <laughs> because <laughs> their parents just need them to graduate yeah just collecting <laughs> tuition money Mm-hmm. And so they can, you know, make them president of some company one day. Of course. Yeah. The like kid who's being like the bully in this in those chapters. I was like, I know so many kids like that. <laughs> I knew of so many kids like that were that were just like that. And I'm like, this is bringing back not so happy memories <laughs> of school and just remembering like the rich kid who knew everybody would just get away with. Ev- literally everything and it's like no one even tried to do anything because they it would never work we're like we're just dealing with this asshole yeah it's kind of like their parents would probably buy somebody off or something if they did do something mm-hmm. yeah. and they're so mean to tyson they are so mean and it like percy even calls it what it is and he's like they like feeling more powerful than the six foot kid mm-hmm. um, because he scares so easily and because he's so sensitive and i i love how percy never gets like frustrated with tyson like literally ever in all of the in all of the books <laughs> there's never a point where he's like god stop crying or yeah. like can you just be like tougher or stronger or what no he never says that to tyson and it's like reason 5000 why you can love percy as a character but he is like a very Percy as a character is a more like soft person, I guess. Um, like he doesn't, he's not like big and tough like that. That's kind of the whole thing with him is that the world wants him to be, but he, no, um, he could never be like that. And he doesn't want to be like that. And so it makes sense why he would feel that way, but it's still so sweet to see him have Tyson as like his brother. Well, and we literally like probably. fight anybody who is mean to him like anyone who's mean to tyson will die <laughs> like don't don't do it just don't do it don't he was mean to brother before he even knew it's so sweet mm-hmm. and it's just so sweet how protective he is of him and how he doesn't because to go with like if you want to think that tyson is someone who has any sort of disability like one of the things that's hard when you have one like that that affects the way that you live like that is feeling like you're like a burden on other people or feeling bad for kind of like ruining people's good times or whatever because you can't do it um Mm -hmm. 
like I went to my sister, my niece had her birthday party and, uh, and like the last like hour or so I was there, I was just like, I really want to go sit in a room by myself in the dark <laughs> because <laughs> this is getting to be like too long of people and noise and socializing and stuff. I mean, it wasn't even that bad, but it was still just lasting for too long for me. And then, and then my sister's boyfriend started popping balloons. Oh no. And then like triggered also the PTSD stuff. He, he popped two balloons and I literally just like walked out and went up to her apartment <laughs> and just sat up there for like 15 minutes until my mom figured out where I was. And she's like, do you want to go home? And I was like, uh-huh. Yeah, I, I do. I, yeah. <laughs> and but it's like that kind of a thing of like yeah we left a little earlier than normal because i was like i'm done with this now and that kind of stuff just makes you feel it, you can't help but feel bad sometimes especially when you're the only one that is having that sort of a reaction and it so it's i love seeing anything in like media like this that shows that like you're supposed to be like the patient and kind and empathetic person when there's someone like that like Mm -hmm. You should never be like the people that are mean to Tyson are seen as the like the villains. You're you're yeah. supposed to be nice to those people and not tell them to stop crying or yeah. anything like that. Just like try to make them feel better when they are sad or when they're scared. Like Percy just gets worried about Tyson when and is like surprised when he's not injured, but he's mm -hmm. like scared that Tyson is going to get hurt. Yeah, uh, it's not anything else but that like it's just reassuring to see a depiction of somebody like that where nobody is telling him to like toughen up yeah like, like a strong man or whatever <laughs> yeah i i think what's interesting about the dynamic here is it's very it's very in line how siblings would react in a neglectful situation and mm -hmm. Yeah, again, Percy doesn't know at this point. He has no idea. So it's so interesting. Yeah, she, he just is like that, I guess. I don't know. It, it makes sense in my mind because when you have shitty life experiences, you do, I don't know, you just like want to protect other kids so that you can tell are going through the same kind of thing as you, even if you yourself are still a kid. Like, mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was in like middle school, but especially when I was in high school, um, when I had, had actual friends, I remember that some of my friends sometimes would be like making fun of some of the other kids I went to school with that were unpopular like me and that I had known since I was, when I started in that school district, when I was in like fourth grade or whatever, and just making fun of them because they were being abused, like things that were not their fault, like, oh, they don't have clean clothes or oh they wore those that shirt yesterday or oh they're dirty and things like that and I remember this one kid especially I remember them making fun of him and I had known him since I was in like fourth grade and I was like stop like I told them all it's like stop like and basically shamed them for doing that and I was like no don't make fun of him that's nothing to do with him it's not his fault that he doesn't that he can't take a shower or he doesn't have clean clothes I was like my parents don't have any money either and we can't buy clothes like my aunt Sarah would come in like would take me and Cassie shopping at the beginning of the school year every year and though and that was like the only clothes that I would wear most of the time for the entire school year was the stuff that she would get would get me because we we couldn't afford anything and like my sister would just ask my mom for new clothes anyway <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I would, I would not because I felt too guilty about that already. And so, like, I know exactly what it was like to be like that. And it's like, stop it. Stop doing that. And they would immediately like stop because I would I but if I wasn't there, I'm sure that they still would make fun of those kids. Yeah. And it's just, you just want to, I just wanted to like help those kids like, and like, I remember one of my neighbors. Um, for a while at least for a couple years <sighs> his family was his parents were both alcoholics i think and when he was still in high school he was like uh when we were juniors and seniors he was working at the dominoes in our t in our town which was like it was there was like dominoes and cousin subs for like 
places that you could buy food from. I still hate Cousin Subs because of how much my mom gave it to us. <laughs> Somehow I still like Domino's, but um, he worked at the Domino's like basically full time because he had to like pay his rent and he was trying to graduate and he did somehow graduate and I remember being so happy that he graduated and it, like finding him at graduation and saying like I'm so like happy for you that you got to do this because it was a huge battle for him yeah. to get that far and so like I think that when you have horrible shit happening in your life you just like want to help other kids somehow you just yeah. want to and it, it just makes so much sense for someone like Percy to be like, no, I will adopt this child. I am a child, but I will also adopt another child who is my age. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. I mean, Percy and Sally are one pay paycheck away from that kind, like from being homeless <laughs> themselves, because I mean, in this one, in the beginning, at least, uh, Sally is working at a candy shop yep. and that can't be a lot, you know, a candy shop in New York. Are you maybe making just a tiny bit over minimum wage, depending on if you're a manager or not? I can't remember. At some point, she sells Gabe. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that makes her a bunch of money. I, I can't remember if that happens in this book or the next one. Well, I guess we'll find out. But at some point, when they do that, that is the only time that they're, like, more mm -hmm. secure, I guess. But they still, you know, they still never have money like that. They still live in like a smaller apartment and they are able to like get all their needs met and everything. And for some of those years, Percy isn't going to like private schools anymore. So yeah. that's like not as expensive anymore and and all that. But they're very much in the same sort of position and they just like adopt children mm -hmm. <laughs> that just like need help. Why yeah. wouldn't they do that? That's just how that's just how they are. I don't remember if they say it later, but was there a reason that Sally didn't actually take Tyson into the house? I don't know. I don't know if it's a situation like uh, we before we recorded, we were talking about like the missed stuff with Tyson. Um, and it, the thing I thought was interesting reading this again was like Percy knows about wouldn't see like the mist anymore because he knows everything now. And he was like seen through it even before he knew everything and Sally can see through it and so I'm like almost like curious if she like actually saw Tyson hmm. um or if she just kind of heard of him or or like if she did see him what she actually saw because it, yeah did you get to the part where Annabeth like is around Tyson a lot and is talking to him and stuff is that in the second chapter no in the second chapter she just says oh we might as well bring him and so, like okay yeah so one thing in like the third chapter that's like a whole dynamic is that Annabeth can see that Tyson is a cyclops mm -hmm. and she's like looking at him and like giving him bad looks and saying comments about like why are you around him and things like that to Percy and he's like what are you talking about like why are you being rude to him and things like and not saying things like that like he's confused by how she's reacting to Tyson she's like why is she saying stuff like this to him or like she says something about he's like looking at Tyson's hands to see to see if he's hurt at all after the whole thing that happens at the school and he's taught and he like is surprised but also like relieved that he's not actually hurt but like annabeth is like yeah of course he wouldn't be hurt and he's just he's still like confused he's like what do you mean and so it's not that like the mist is necessarily protecting him at least because she can see him and she can see like what's that he's a, a cyclops or whatever but percy can't and i legitimately just think it's percy avoiding it <laughs> like in his mind because he just is stressed out by everything <laughs> and and like doesn't and is probably it would probably freak him out not because he was a cyclops necessarily but the idea that like he was just trying to get through seventh grade without something going wrong mm -hmm. and to be aware of the fact that there's like a, a you know technically a monster that is at school with you every day and could possibly you know, bring another bad monster to you would be, I think that would be too much for 
13 year old Percy <laughs> when yeah. he's already having nightmares about stuff and he knows that Luke is out there somewhere and he's alone. Um, but that was one part about that that I thought was interesting was him just acknowledging like, I haven't seen Grover since he left. I haven't seen Annabeth in like months that they like email back and forth sometimes, but they still mm -hmm. haven't seen each other in almost a year by that point. And it would be hard to deal with all of that stuff and not be able to tell anybody about it. And so I honestly think it was him just like, be like, if I don't look at him, that I don't have to actually deal with this because it feels like too much for me to handle right now. <laughs> yeah, because the way they describe it, it was like, I can't, he says, I can't tell you what color his eyes are because I can never make it past his teeth looking at him. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, yeah, the way that I first interpreted that is like the mist makes him so hard to look at that like, you know, people just don't want to look up. But yeah, mm -hmm. I guess. I guess it's more of a Percy thing. Um, and I mean, I guess, I wonder if Sally is seeing some version of that at least. Like she knows clearly this isn't a human, but she doesn't yeah. know what. Yeah, I have to imagine that Sally realizes that something is going on because like New York City is horrible and there are, also, are stories of people, kids being homeless and going to school and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's also hard to believe, like, completely believe that a 13 year old kid could be living on the street and everyone at school knows that they're living on the street and no one does anything about it because mandatory reporters are a thing and teachers are mandatory reporters do they actually do that though no <laughs> like i went through my entire schooling history being abused the fuck out of my dad and nobody reported a single fucking thing ever and it was it was trust me when i remember things that i would say or that ways that i would act i could have like there should have been like something like across my forehead like i'm being abused <laughs> like i did i wore like the same clothes all the time i would wear really baggy clothes all the time so no one could like see my body I didn't like like wearing makeup or anything like that. I would not talk. Like I had no friends. I would not talk to anybody when I was at school. Like people would have to work to hear me when I would talk. If I would talk, I would talk to my teachers more than anyone else. And I would also, I'm sure just like say things that shows that like the relationship we had was supremely fucked up and nobody ever said anything and my dad was constantly coming to school and yelling at people <laughs> and so it's not like that was like a mist like a mystery <laughs> like everyone like i specifically remember seventh grade that i missed <coughs> so much school in seventh grade i don't even know how it's a, a lot i miss a lot a lot in seventh grade i like missed at least half to like two-thirds of the school year i just wasn't there and <laughs> And the days when I would go, sometimes I would leave early because of the couple months when I was in therapy and stuff. Mm -hmm. I like didn't do any of my schoolwork. I didn't even try doing it a lot of the time. And my teachers just passed me anyway because they literally said, you're a nice kid and we feel bad. Oh my gosh. We're just gonna pass you anyway because when I was in seventh grade was when my dad was like in a battle with like the basketball coach at our middle school <laughs> and it, things like that. And so, people knew him, they knew what he was like. And, but still, as far as I'm aware, and I feel like I would be, I would be aware at this point, cause I looked it up when I was older. I never got anything from like CPS or anything like that ever. Mm -hmm. And like, they absolutely should have like a hundred percent. They should have, if you see a kid acting like that, you should definitely do something about it instead of doing absolute <laughs> jack shit <laughs> even if i would have gotten really mad at you and so like the the cynical like abused survivor person of my brain is like yeah but even if they knew they still would do nothing because they they don't and so like i want to believe that a school even if in a school in a fake <laughs> world would like at least pretend like they care but i also know that they they usually don't especially if it's like a rich school yeah something. they just don't they fall back on that whole thing of oh somebody else will do it and i don't 
or like I don't want to get involved in like your personal family drama and things like that. And so I could see the school just falling back on that of being like, nah, we're just going to leave the kid like living in a refrigerator box. Yeah, well, I mean, they don't even care enough to teach their classes, so. <laughs> yeah, they definitely don't care. And what was the reason that the the bully kid was there? He had, like, a chipped tooth because he, like, stole his dad's motorcycle or something like that. He joy rode a car and crashed it, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like that. <laughs> I just was like, yeah, you would, you would, and then also get away with it. Like my high school experience, <laughs> I just remember when I was in high school that um, it's so weird because the super rich kids would get away with like everything in life and everyone else would get away with uh, pretty much nothing. And so I, it was like a normal thing my last two years of high school to come to class and hear other kids, the popular kids in class talking about how like the weekend before one of them had a drinking party at their house and like my mom worked in the liquor department of our like small town grocery store and so she would tell me about how these kids parents would come in with their kids standing right there and buy them like kegs of beer and buy them all this alcohol and stuff and so they would be home and they would stop our small town police department from coming in and then when they would come in, they would give them tickets for every single minor that was in the house drinking. <laughs> and, but like, it would be like, oh yeah, the police were sent to this really rich neighborhood again because one of the neighbors noticed that there's a teenage boy in the, in the front lawn of somebody's house peeing on a tree. That like happened every single weekend. Or like there was one time that they were in a hotel room and oh, everyone yeah. jumped out of the window. Oh <laughs> and, so, and so like, they're like these seniors walking around like, hobbling around because they jumped out of a second story window and the only people left in the in the hotel room when they like when the police got the door open was the guy who bought the hotel room because he obviously couldn't leave and a kid who was getting sick in the bathroom oh my gosh and like that was just like a normal occurrence at school which is i think it's funny because my sister and i hate drinking because these were like the popular kids that we fucking despised we hated mm -hmm. everything about them and so neither one of us wanted to drink at all the entire time that we were in school because those were the kids that did that. Yeah. Um, but that's that's what this dynamic reminds me of that like the entire school knows that all the most popular kids regularly have drinking parties and will jump out of people's windows in order to run away from the police. And nothing happens to them. Yeah, well, me and my friends are like working jobs so that we can like have the luxury of trying to go to college. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> That's like what we were trying to do. Can I just go to college and like buy a car so I can like leave my house and go do something else because everything is far away? <laughs> yeah, like Matt Sloan is a well-written bully because I feel like enough of us have that experience of like, how is this kid the kid with money? You know, like <laughs> this asshole. And like, I love Rick's description of He's wearing nice clothes, but he's wearing them badly on purpose. Yes. Yeah. I just, like picture people like that in my mind of like, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. The people who wear all of like the, des not even like designer, but like the popular clothing brands of the moment, but they're all like baggy, like too big sized for them. Or they like, if their shirt's supposed to be tucked in, they like don't tuck it in. So it's like, they think they're being like a, a rebel. Yeah. by like wearing the clothes wrong and it's like you just you just look like a jerk and you spent all of this money on clothes that i just remember knowing thinking about that in middle school that kids would wear back when i was in middle school was when abercrombie and fitch became like a thing like that was they were like a newly popular brand back then that freaking um, LFO song that mentioned Abercrombie and Fitch came out then. And I legitimately think that's why it became so popular. Um, but I remember that kids, like popular kids would be buying clothes from there all the time. And that place was a sensory nightmare. I would walk in there with my sister and last in there for like 30 seconds and leave because they always played their music so loud. Yeah, why is it so loud? <laughs> Didn't they get lawsuits or something because of the perfume? I think so. I hope they got sued because they're horrible. But mm -hmm. I just remember that their clothes, even back in like the 90s, were like super expensive where like my mom could buy like my sister like one pair of pants 
and like that was like one or one shirt it would be like the shittiest t-shirt and it would be like 45 dollars in like 1998 yeah Which i don't even know how much money that would be right now i don't want to think about it but it was just that sort of a thing and while you're like the kid like percy or, or grover or not grover percy or tyson or whatever where you're like trying to ground like get money together to be able to like just feed yourself or have like enough to get by and there are these kids walking around wearing clothes that they could sell and make way more money than you'll make in like an entire year yeah and they're just like wearing it wrong and they don't care and they don't care if they mess it up because they can just buy new clothes well yeah. you're like i have to like make this clothes last because if if something happens to the clothes that i have i don't have any to replace it yeah yeah like abercrombie and fitch i feel like it was having its moment like around the time that this book came out because when i was when I was in high school, there was another revival of it. So like mm -hmm. the company itself, I didn't know how long, long that company has been open until I started taking some fashion education because I think they designed, I want to say it was one of the first women military uniforms. Um, yeah. yeah, but uh, like they've gone a long way since then. And um, I think what was popular was most people would just get the logo shirts because I'm sure those were the cheapest and mm -hmm. like short shorts or the um what was it the little cami tank tops with the lace um like people would get the cheap abercrombie items but the ones that you could wear with enough stuff to make it look like you had them and i actually had a boyfriend who had the opposite thing going on of like the rich kid trying to look sloppy where it was he was like poor but i didn't know he was because he was always an abercrombie and it turned out he worked there and Back then, when you worked there, they gave you clothes because they wanted you to always be wearing them. So he would just like a, a smart thing to do. Yeah. So he would just get clothes for him and his sister that way. But like when I went to their house, it was total hoarder situation. And I was just like, I was not expecting this at all. What the heck? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was I going to say? Oh, I was going to talk about the TV show. The show just, mm -hmm. I think this is legitimate. I always like wait a little bit when there's news of anything just to be sure it's actually real. Yeah. Um, but they, some, some website was posting about their filming schedule and that they're supposed to start filming on August 1st and then will stop filming the end of January, like January 20, 25th or something. Um, and I don't know why season two is filming is only six months and the first season was 10 months. <laughs> I could like speculate on that, but I honestly don't know why it's like that. Um, I don't know. I don't know if like the, if Arian and Dior who play Clarice and um, Grover being 18 make that much, I can't imagine it will because Annabeth and Percy are both 15 still, and they can work like a little bit longer, but I can't imagine it would make that much of a difference. Yeah. Um, but either way, I don't, maybe it's because there's like less sets, like season one, they're like in a different city every day. Mm -hmm. And this season there's like, you know, certain like islands and stuff, but it's not that much. Mm -hmm. It's not as much as season one. So maybe that makes a difference either way. The filming is only for like six months this time and so that's cool to think that they could possibly i must i i always try to like go out farther than i think it will be then imagine that if they are done at like the end of january that maybe the second season will come out in like the fall or something like that nice. um, or summer or fall or something i would imagine as long as there isn't like another strike they would be able to just finish it because season one they finished it like the end of february and mm -hmm. the strike happened in like june and they were still able to finish everything to come out in december and it probably would have come out sooner if the strike wasn't happening for the majority of the year yeah. um, so that was just a little bit of something i guess about the show and that they're filming all of it in the same place in canada again um mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting to see it, it like how they depict everything um i was trying to remember the things that happen in the show that will be different than the books um 
Well, I one thing that came to mind during this discussion was like talking about how Annabeth right away kind of like discriminates against uh, Tyson, I guess is the best word we can use. Yeah, yeah she we does. Also have a different dynamic going on with Leah being black. Like maybe she's not going to be as prone to being judgmental like that. But then again, we also saw her immediately be like, oh, Medusa, we need, we need to <laughs> It's, it's, it'll be interesting, especially considering whoever they cast for Tyson. Um, like, it's been, when was the last time they cast a white person? Maybe Walker? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, it, like, Poseidon, I suppose. Um, but, like, it's been a while since they have. And so it's, it's a high probability that, that Tyson won't be. And it, so that makes that whole dynamic different than it is in the books where every where they're both white but it also like just fits with like annabeth kind of personality because she does have a reason for why she is like that about cyclops because she was traumatized by one when she was younger with luke and so i can't imagine that would change too much but it is like a like even reading like the third chapter of this, it's interesting to read her like being like, get that thing away from me. And like, why do you want to be around this thing? Well, while Percy is like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, like I have adopted this homeless child. What do you, why are you being mean to this child who just loves peanut butter that I've been protecting this entire year because I have to do something to protect somebody. I can't just not protect something <laughs> and for all this time when I'm trying to go to school. Um, but it is like a weird dynamic to like read her almost like not being on board with him. And that's very much like a thing that I like that part of it. Like, I like the fact that she's wrong um, mm -hmm. and that she has to be like, she has to confront like the reasons why she feels like that. Because yeah, like the, I love Ty Tyson's whole thing is that it, he is the sweetest little child and he even though he's a cyclops he would never hurt anyone ever he's not dangerous he's not scary there's so many more people that are way more scarier than he is and it just because he's a cyclops it doesn't mean that there's inherently something wrong with him mm -hmm. and i just like them bringing this up <laughs> because that's like a, a definite theme kind of with a character like luke in this wow. series especially because Hermie sucks in the second book. We haven't we haven't gotten to that yet, but he is a little gaslighting little bitch baby, and it, it makes me mad remembering what he's like because I can't, I'm not 100 percent sure if it's this book or another book, but at some point he literally he says to Percy like like oh you can never just stop talking to your family. How, what, when have we ever heard that before? And what he literally tell, says to Percy, like, oh, yeah, no matter how bad your family is, you can never just stop talking to them. And it's literally like Hermie is trying to justify telling Percy to go talk to Luke when Luke tries to fucking kill him every yeah. single time he does. And it's, and I can't remember if it's this book that he does that with or not, but either way, like when they get to camp and they see what's wrong with everything and on all that the reason why they leave is because hermes lets them leave and the reason the only reason he lets like he does this is because he wants percy to go and like save luke and all that happens is that luke tries to kill him a lot and and annabeth and grover and it's it's like really brutal what like how that ends at like the end of the book like it's honestly it's going to be dep like depressing as hell. It's, I'm going to be really angry, like reading that because mm -hmm. the last fight is horrible and obviously we'll get there, but it's really pathetic, like how easy it is to, for Percy to goad Luke into a fight at the end of this book. Like, yeah, he 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 has a reason to do it. Like he's trying to stop him from hurting camp. Mm -hmm. um, and so he literally just insults him like. He just like baits his ego for three seconds and Luke almost kills him. <laughs> and it's, it's like, honestly, it's very lucky that he doesn't, that they don't all die, but it's like, 
they they don't need to like Luke doesn't have anything that he's necessarily fighting him about. Mm -hmm. Just literally Percy just like makes him feel insecure for three seconds to get him to fight him and it gets so badly that he can't walk because Luke hurts him so bad that he can't use one of his legs and mm -hmm. and is like crawling across the floor <laughs> like tr while Luke is standing over him laughing at him yeah. and like all he does is be like oh you could never beat me in a fight or something like that and it leads to that and the reason why he's doing he's like interacting with Luke at all like he doesn't want to during that last fight he has he's like kind of forced to but like Luke is looking for them because they ran into him in the beginning of the book because his stupid ass father told him to and it's like what and he just like continues with that kind of like my child is not lost you need to save him and it's like go fuck yourself yes. <laughs> and so the part of that that's different obviously is that we've met hermes already mm -hmm. and hermes in season one is very like he's at least admitting very openly the things that he has done not so great yeah. and basically is like i suck as a dad and your dad told me that i suck as a dad but we both agreed that we both suck as dads and okay that's pretty much that conversation and so we at least had him be empathetic but in this season it's like it's hard to not get fucking pissed at him I, it, it's like the whole thing with these books of it's going to be a lot harder to not get like for the audience to not get like super angry at some of these characters when we're having to like literally watch it happen instead of reading it in a book yeah it's it's easier to hear I, <laughs> i'm just thinking of like all the people like us out there who like percy jackson and have like had to go no contact with family members or are thinking about it or our kids that like hate their parents because their parents suck ass hearing like somebody like Hermes be like, you just have to always talk to your family because they're your family and you just have to forgive them no matter how horrible they are. And it's like, no, <laughs> no, I reject this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be pretty hard to hear that. And I don't know. I want to see how Lin-Manuel Miranda plays that because mm -hmm. it's going to be very good. Because, yeah, I don't know, Hermes is very, like, even after Luke is dead, he's very much like, oh, I am sad because my child did this, but I, but my child was also a hero. And it's like, I will vomit on your head if you, <laughs> like, I would rather do that than actually admit or, like, ever believe that Luke is actually, like, the hero. I don't care if the prophecy says that he is the hero. Yeah, no, yeah. I don't think that he actually is the one that is. I think that it's somebody else when we get to that point. But it's that's one of those things with this book being turned into the show that will be interesting is that you're forced to kind of, it's a lot harder to kind of let that stuff go when you're going to have to actually watch this stuff happen, especially if they change, because they could always change things around in some way. Like it's mm -hmm. impossible to think about what they could change because it's you just don't there's so many different things that they could do yeah and i don't even try going there in my head because it just doesn't make sense <laughs> and like in my brain it doesn't make sense like before i watched like the finale i never considered that annabeth would be there to during like the last fight yeah. and and throw luke's dagger at his head <laughs> and be like i fucking hate you you stupid asshole and and all that kind of stuff when we watched it it made complete sense but before that scene happened i never would have even considered it like an option to even change anything about that scene and so these like stories are like embedded in my head so i just can't even try to like act like i could figure out how like i give the the writers credit for being able to figure out things that they could change <laughs> because i i would be bad at that i just like these they're set in my head in one way and i can't like deter that far from them but i'm sure that they will change things rick riordan has said that that he every time he gets like a script change or whatever he mentions it when he posts on social media and talks about like why he okays certain changes and stuff like that mm -hmm. um, 
And so there could be things that they change with that. The thing with this book that's interesting is that it's the shortest one out of all the other, out of the entire series. And so it means that there's things that they could conceivably add in because they have more time um, to do that. Uh, I don't know what they would, but they could do that if they really wanted to. Um, so the Hermes thing could be something, and I don't remember, I can't, I can't remember if at the end of The Lightning Thief, Percy has like the dream that he does on the show where Kronos is telling him like, you need to stay alive in order for my plan to work. Like, I think something to that. I can't remember what he says to him in that dream, but the one where he wakes up and says like, oh, I talked about Grandpa. Grandpa. Grandpa Kronos. I love that. And so I can't remember if he has that dream or not in the in the first book, because if he doesn't, then he if he doesn't, he finds out about it sometime in this book. And I guess if he doesn't, we'll like see it happen later on. But that does give him a more clear perspective. Like it's kind of this scary, ominous thing in the back of his mind all the time of like, what does that mean? Yeah. Like why would why would the super mega villain um want me to be alive I don't want to be alive if it means that everyone's gonna die (laughs) and like that whole thing like the last thing Percy needs is somebody telling him that him being alive is a bad thing like the 17th person to (laughs) ever mention him that to him just this week like let's not let's not make this any worse grandpa what you're doing it anyway but like so that brings a different if that doesn't happen at the end of the first book it just leaves it as something like kind of in the back of his mind um, in between the seasons that he I'm sure is spending as much as his PTSD brain can not thinking about it but you can't help but think about something like that of like what does that mean what I don't want to hurt people um, but that's bad (laughs) and like how do I get out of this stuff Um, I'm trying to remember other stuff that they changed but I think that's like the main things that are different i'm the main thing with the tv show that i hope they change and this is just me being like selfish is that i just want more scenes with grover Uh um because i love arian and i love arian with um the other two actors their chemistry the three of them together is so great and there's hardly going to be any of that in the third um episode uh, season because annabeth is kidnapped for for the majority of that season i wonder if they're going to write him in a little bit more in the third So I hope that they find some way to bring him in. They have some more scenes with him, at least alone or something, or they have just more time, more episodes or whatever, where they reunite with him in his wedding dress. Oh my God, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Before they like actually get to like the end, like just make that part of the story last a little bit longer or have them rescue him before they get to like Cersei's Island or something, something, something. I don't know. Whatever they come up with that would, and I'm sure they will want to because they also love Arian and want him to be in as many scenes as they can. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. Um, I was going to say this, but I forgot to. When we were talking about Percy and Grover's friendship and how sweet it is, mm-hmm. that the the acting coach that they all talk about, how much they love, um, he did an interview with a podcast that I haven't listened to because I'm quite sure it's going to make me cry because the one thing that this acting coach does really well is he um he like very well explains the like complicated like complex emotions that all of their characters are feeling Mm -hmm. um like i remember there's like a small clip in the behind the scenes documentary where they're watch there's they're just filming him talking to them before a scene and he's explaining like, what does Kleos mean? And they say like glory, like that's the way that he explains what Kleos and glory and stuff mean of like being known and like doing something because in that way, it's a way to like get like a bunch of teenage kids to understand what that really even means. And um, anyway, in this, the one clip from that interview I saw that I was like, yeah, you're definitely gonna make me cry. <laughs> Whenever I get like, when I just, and when I'm sad and crying already, and I decide this is the time to watch this when I'm already sad. 
um he's very sweet like as a person i would love to talk to him because he very much like kind of mirrors what we say about this stuff but he was saying that they were asking about it was like a percy and annabeth like specific question and i thought it was funny because in like the his like his camera you can tell by the look on his face that he looks like annoyed that they're asking about only them <laughs> and i was like i agree with you sir thank you for looking kind of annoyed by that and he's like he's like i consider grover as part of this as well and he was saying that um he's like they, they like recognize the like orphanness in each other mm -hmm. and like the way he described it was like was like percy recognizes the fact that Annabeth doesn't have a good mom in her life and it just makes him think about how he does about how he misses his mom because oh she is a good mom and how like Annabeth would see that Percy doesn't have like a found family kind of thing he's yeah. not around people who understand him and she does and so she knows what that's like to like miss that because she she has that and like the say and he's basically saying like the way he described it was like it's like kids that just find each other at like a playground and mm -hmm. then as they're talking you realize that like all of their parent all of your parents are divorced or something like that you all have something in common and you're yeah. like oh that's weird i didn't know that about you that that's literally every every single friend <laughs> that i've made that has become like a legitimate friend in my life I get to know them and then they start telling me their like traumatic tragic family backstory <laughs> like i that it was just such a sweet way to describe that because i'm like yeah that's exactly and he like starts crying when in this clip when he's talking about it and i'm like yeah that's exactly what that like dynamic is like i i'm remembering how when i was in like high school one of my closest friends in high school um we became friends for like months or, or like a year or something before we ever like hung out like at each other's houses no one ever came to my house they like i went to her house but um i remember that i we were friends for like a year or so and then she told me that her mom was uh essayed by her dad mm -hmm. and it, that it was like this whole weird thing where her mom would her mom was like the worst where she would just like openly talk about it with her like oh my gosh explicit sort of stuff and and like basically do that horrible thing of like you can't be that upset about your childhood because mine was actually really bad oh. and that i want to slap the shit out of like every incest survivor who does that to people i get so angry because it's like no you don't you don't get to like have super traumatic experiences and then use them as a weapon you're not able to I'm sorry, you can't yeah. claim those as trauma anymore if you're using it to make other people feel bad so that they don't get mad at you. And like, it was just, I remember at that time looking, I look back at that now and I'm just like, that is fucking hilarious. That one of my closest friends, their mom went through what I was going through ex at that time, but I didn't mm -hmm. say that. And, it, and they didn't know that about me. And that friend went through something, not that, but something in that general area. Mm -hmm. um, as well and and all that kind of stuff and it's just one of those strange things that like i didn't know about any of that stuff until we were friends for like over a year or two years or something yeah and, and it, we just like we became friends because we would talk about like theater stuff and like yeah. and like you know tv and movies and things like that that we watched we did like stage crew together that's like how we became friends we, we didn't know anything about any of that stuff. And that's literally every single person that I've ever become friends with. At this point, I just like, wait for, wait for it to happen. I'm like, yeah, you're going to tell me something. I know you are. You're going to tell me something. Neurodivergent thing. Like, I feel like part of it might be that because like, was it you? Who's, I don't remember if you sent me this video or if you stitched it, but it was the one of someone talking about being the secret friend. Oh, yeah, yeah yeah so i had that experience with a few of my friends like mm -hmm. there definitely was friends who i wasn't a secret with and those are the ones that either had trauma or were neurodivergent and um the the ones that kept me a secret they at least had some like skin in the game like one of my best friends she did have trauma but she was popular so 
she didn't hang out with me at school, but we hung out all the time after school. Yeah, that's how most of my friends were for a lot of life was friends, friends like that, like a friend. I don't know. It's hard to even call those people friends. Um, yeah. Like my mom and I were talking about this recently and she's like, those people did care about you. And I'm like, yeah, but like, what does that really matter if they cared, but not enough to like actually be helpful in any real way? Um, yeah. Like one of the childhood friends I had, like she would tell me that she would never invite me to her birthday parties. We didn't go. I, that was, she was somebody I was friends with at my very first school that I moved away from in second grade. And it was, I look back at that now that a lot of the kids, they're girls that like bullied me really badly. Um, like my mom was telling, I brought this up with my mom recently cause she would remember more things than me. And she, and it made me remember that there was a time that I went to like a kid's, this was back when, for some reason, we would all have birthday parties at McDonald's. Oh, <laughs> and no, McDonald's was like actually. the place where you wanted to have birthday parties at. It was like the popular place. I don't know what, why we did that in the, in the nineties. It was, I don't know what made that stop either. <laughs> at some point it did. Anyway, I went to one of those and, um, the girls that did, didn't, that hated me, um, that two of them like later apologized to me later on in life. And I was just like, go away. Um, pretty much they, one of them like stole my shoes because they liked the shoes that I had on. And so I was forced to wear their shoes home that didn't fit me. And my mom, like, I, and I remember getting home and that my feet hurt a lot and that they were like, you know, bruised and stuff. Um, when I got home and that my mom noticed, of course, right away and called and called those kids moms and was like, was like, your daughter stole my daughter's shoes. These are obviously not hers because they don't even fit her feet. You need to bring them back to me right now. And yeah. like the mom like apologized for her kid and did it. But those girls were like friends with that friend. And after I moved away, she would tell me like, oh, I'm not inviting you because you don't know any of my friends. But I think that she just I was the secret friend that no one else from her school probably knew that we were even still friends anymore. Yeah. Um, because none of them liked me, obviously. They like were horrible to me. <laughs> like, and from like kindergarten on, they just didn't like me. And ugh. and like, there were people like that all the way through school that is part of why I have like a complex with friends now that I have a hard time believing that that's not still happening. Yeah. Um, or that somebody is going to suddenly just like change their mind about me and just like leave because that happens so much that I that it's just I just got used to it <laughs> of like, yeah, this is probably going to happen. So I'm going to enjoy what I have with this like friend while I can and just hope that it doesn't stop at some point. Um, yeah, it's just a horrible dynamic when that kind of stuff happens. It is a very neurodivergent thing to happen. Um, yeah. And it, it's like weirdly, ref I don't know. It's like weirdly reflected sometimes in like the actors who play these kids on screen. Mm -hmm. Like Walker literally said that he did not have friends until he started doing acting and okay. that the Percy Jackson cast was his first like actual friend group. And this child did not say that they, that he thought that they were actually friends until like three months ago. <laughs> I was okay. like, and I was like, honey, like you guys filmed an entire season for 10 months together and and then did a bunch of press for another six months after that. And it wasn't until like two months ago that you actually felt sure that these people were your friends. <laughs> like that says enough on its own about yeah. what kind of experience he had at school. Dear God. <laughs> That's some like, pattern placement shit because he's like, I'm at work. They're co-workers. They're being nice to me because they're co-workers. Yeah, like they have or like they're nice to me, but like, maybe they don't really like me or maybe they're being nice to me because they have to be around me, but they don't actually like me that much. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I would, that I say to myself still to this day, but especially back then it would be like, yeah, maybe they're just being nice to me because they have to, because especially with somebody, a child like him, like he's Percy Jackson, <laughs> like he's in ev almost every scene of the show. There's only a couple of scenes in the whole season one that he's not in. And so it's like, are you really not going to get along with the kid that is around like at work with you every single day for like 10 hours every single day for 10 months? 
Yeah. Like that makes it hard to believe that they actually do like you. If, if you at least have a history of people not liking you in the past, um, because you feel like they're just being, they have to like me because they have to be around me. Um, mm -hmm. That's a hard thing to like completely let go of. But I, I do think that it's weirdly reflected, like with him, at least in the cast, and then also shows up in Percy, like he identifies with Percy a lot because that's also Percy. <laughs> Like yeah. Grover is his only long-term friend. And even the beginning of this book, he's like almost questioning, like, um, Annabeth is still my friend, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, let me look at her picture. Like, I thought that one of the things that was like funny, but also is like, do you want to die? <laughs> was when the like the the villain um bully kid took Annabeth's picture. Mm -hmm. and started like ripping the sides of it and stuff and he was just like give that back to me right now and he was just like who's this girl and then when she shows up in gym in like the gym class and stuff he's like oh it's the girl from the photo <laughs> it was just like, that whole thing of how the rich kid is just watching all of this whatever he sees who knows what he actually saw but it just it like summed up my like I think every unpopular kids, especially neurodivergent kids experience in middle school that the rich asshole is the one that starts everything. Mm -hmm. He instigates the whole thing. The Canadians are friends are like hanging around him because he's a horrible person. So monsters literally like, yeah, you're cool. And mm -hmm. they they're the ones that start the entire thing. He's like sitting there laughing about like Percy and stuff and and Tyson getting hurt everything like literally blows up and goes horrible and then when the teacher wakes up from it he immediately is like oh it was Percy's fault and yeah. the teacher just believes him and it's like of course that's what happens of course. of course you believe the kid that is known for starting fights over the kid that spends his entire year trying to get people to be nice to a homeless kid I'm so curious how they're going to play that one. That scene is going to be done well. If, mm -hmm. if they're going to do any scene well to start off that first episode, it's probably going to be that one. Yeah. And I can't wait to see how they interpret the mist that the teacher is going through. Because the book, Percy is making assumptions. He's saying, I'm pretty sure he was getting feedback in his hearing aid. So he's reading a magazine. He can't hear that literally. These kids are dropping. I mean, the, the chapter calls them cannonballs. Like, yes. yeah, and they're fiery. Like, that's part of why he was so scared Tyson was hurt. Mm -hmm. So, like, what what are we going to see that, like, I want to see the back and forth of, like, I do too. the teacher's vision and this is what's actually happening. Okay, I remember I liked, I liked how in, like, the fourth episode when they're on the train, that and like the chimera that has like three heads yeah. and has like a stinger thing is attacking them but when like that random family sees it they see like a tiny little like poodle <laughs> and so they're like well, how is a poodle making all of this like ruckus yeah and so i'm like i i liked how they like show the difference and so that will be a scene that will be really interesting for them to do that because they kind of have to because how else like there's no other way to describe like how a, a a regular person could be sitting in this room where there are multiple monsters throwing cannonballs at their head and trying to kill and literally yelling about how they want to kill him and like and all this kind of stuff without them noticing so it'll be really interesting <laughs> to see what they come up with to show like what is the teacher see or even like the bully kid like, what does the bully kid see? Like, what does he think is happening right now? Does yeah. he have any idea at all of what is actually going on? Like, he can't actually know what's really happening. Is he, like, confused about how much destruction seems to be happening from, like, regular dodgeballs? Um, yeah. It would just be interesting to show that because I think that this scene is one of the ones in the books that shows the most of how it's, like, impossible for Percy to just like exist <laughs> like yeah. and like 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 he like the thing that is like so frustrating about that whole scene beyond what how it happens is that it's the last day of school and that school and he gets um expelled on his last freaking day he makes it through the entire year before that all happens on his very last day and 
there's no way that he could ever explain what happened. There's no way that anyone would ever believe that he didn't do something to somehow cause that to happen, even though it makes no sense that yeah. a seventh grade kid would have like weapons that could do all of that stuff. Like they like destroy like the door to like the locker room, like it, like the, like the gym is on fire. And so it's just like this horrible helpless moment that he spends that entire year trying so hard not to have fights with anyone dealing mm -hmm. with somebody being horrible to him every single day at school and being horrible to Tyson, but like tries to do what he can to like stay under the radar in the way that a lot of kids like us do where we don't tell like teachers and stuff what's really going on because we because we don't want to get in trouble like like my way of doing that was in like seventh grade one of the days that I actually did go to school um I left one of my do you remember in like middle school and high school that you had to like put like paper bags from like the grocery store on all of your books for like book wow. covers so I left my book cover like that for whatever book that was in like my homeroom and then um, wasn't there a day and then came back the next day after that. And uh, this one of the girls that really didn't like me for no reason at that school, um, she saw that it was my book because it obviously had my name on it. And she wrote like all of this horrible, mean stuff all over the book, like basically calling me fat a million times. Oh like she God. she wrote like like called jenny craig and things like that because that was a popular cover right? yeah that's such an old school that that definitely aged just and like <laughs> weight, like weight watchers stuff and things like that and and it was just like things like and literally all over the book on the front and the back of the book it was completely covered in it and i had to you look at that book and use it in one of my classes and i remember that this like it was bad enough that the kids in my class, I don't remember who this was, but I remember it was like one of the more popular boys in our grade saw like what she had written on my book and came up to me in homeroom class and told me like, you need to tell one of the teachers about this because that is really bad that she did that. And I'm like, it, and like looking back at that, I'm like, it's really bad when one of the popular kids is like, no, that is like too far. I didn't tell anybody. I yeah. like sat there in class staring at what was written on that book and just like was like, yep, that's me. I'm a horrible person <laughs> and just stared at it. I brought it home from school and just like dumped my backpack like on the floor as you do by my like, like by the front door of our house. And my mom saw that book and lost her fucking shit and was like, what the hell is this? Who did this? Who did this to you? And like, what is happening? And I told her. And I told her like the girl's name that I thought that people told me did it. And she like called the school. She like went to the school in person the next day and was like, what are you doing about this? Holy fuck. Like, and was just like raging for a while about it. I didn't say anything. And I thought that she was on, I remember trying to convince her not to do anything. Yeah. And it was like, you're just wasting your time. And it, that sort of stuff just reminds me of that whole dynamic with Percy that he is like just trying to get through a school year because he knows why he can't get through one and there's only so much he can do so he just has to put up with this shit and just hope that he can get through only for it to be ruined on the last stupid day yeah and like the fact that he just walks out of the gym with annabeth yeah like not even trying to explain himself or deal with any teachers he's done it so many times that he's just like yeah no we're not doing this bye yeah and it's just like that horrible helpless feeling of like you know that no one is no one's ever going to believe me that i wasn't the one who did this anyone at the school would look at my record and they would assume that it was me and they're just never going to believe that i'm not the one behind all of this they're definitely not going to believe like the, that the rich kid did it over me um and you just are like i give up <laughs> and and like all of the like magical things in this world can be there are like real world like things that mirror that and that's just such a that's such a normal experience especially when you have abusive people at home is that like you can't do stuff like that you can't say things like that to because they'll they're gonna find out about it um even like bad stuff that is happening to you you don't want to tell them about it because their reaction to it will be like insane 
compared to how most people would react. And so you just don't say anything. And it, that's basically what that is, is like, well, no one's going to believe me if I try to say that I, that I didn't do this horrible thing. Um, there's so many things like that when I was growing up with like my dad that people thought that I was me in middle school was like so many people thought that I was a bad person because of how my dad was that they just thought that I was like that too yeah. and it's like an impossible thing of like I can't tell you that I hate him too um, because if he found out about that that would be really bad and so I just like can't say anything and it's also like I can't say anything because I don't think that you would believe me anyway um, and that happened later on like when I was in college the things that like my sister did when I was in college meant that none of my college roommates like really liked me and like how do I there was no way for me to explain that of like my sister did this stuff to you I didn't know about it until you just told me and it's like would they ever believe me that my that I didn't know that my younger sister was doing that stuff to them off of the information she got from my computer when I came home from school on breaks and stuff like so I just didn't even try I didn't even I didn't even try to like um, to defend myself or like try to say that very much. I just said it once and then just, and I was like, they're never going to believe me. And I just like left it. And that's basically what he's being forced to do of like, well, I guess we, we have to go to camp anyway. So I might as well just leave because there's no way the school isn't going to evict me. So I just like give up trying. Well, and I think the one thing that like makes me feel a little bit better about how this one went down than like the first one is that he doesn't have everyone around him gaslighting anymore because yeah. before like in the beginning the thing with miss stodds and the lightning thief you kind of are wondering oh is this like a childhood fantasy hallucination thing but in this one you're like no it's real but because of circumstances literally no one is going to believe him so he just has to walk away from the situation yeah like at least in this situation like annabeth is there and he knows that this really happened and that it wasn't really his fault like his mom his mom would never not believe him anyway but he knows especially now that she definitely will believe him and that any of the other kids at camp would understand this whole situation that he's not by himself this time mm -hmm. that annabeth and tyson are both on his side in that way even if nobody else is yeah. <laughs> like i'm just imagining like sally at home that day she never get, she never sees percy like again for a little while after that like they go on their quest right after this and so then she doesn't get to tell him what's going on at camp and instead gets a phone call from his school principal being like your son blew up the gym yeah how did he blow up the gym we're not sure why do you think that it's him then <laughs> like i just can't i just like imagine how many conversations like that she had with like that story I was telling about my mom I just imagine Sally doing similar things of just showing up at school being like fuck you guys yeah. <laughs> and like fuck everything about this stupid school that you immediately just are sure that my son is the one who did it um just because he's not here and didn't try to stand up for himself basically what is but it's like if this happens would you want to stay and like and want to stay at the school any longer if something like that happened to you when you were here like no you would leave yeah. what are you talking about yeah and we have like a mortal bully who's so horrible that the lice dragonians attach to him immediately and like yeah. without question because percy's just like these random kids are a part of his group there's usually only two but like randomly they're here and they all seem to be normal and the, like this is normal for them mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah it's it's so interesting like because rick's kind of doing two things with that in my opinion he's showing that the bully is really that bad and he's showing that like that it, it can be so believable how some of these things are happening because they're like oh yeah this is par for the course for bully behavior yeah and like it's one of those it's just that frustrating thing of the one like part of Percy Jackson fan fiction I think is fun to read is when people mash up Percy with um, the Avengers mm -hmm. because the event even the Avengers stuff is like small for people in Percy Jackson where and but it's a really funny dynamic all the time because a lot of those stories start with the Avengers trying to kidnap him. <laughs> 
or or like arrest him because they think that he's a terrorist because of all the schools that he got kicked out of and that he gets kicked out of most of them because of bombs in like the Percy Jackson world, you know, the whole thing with like the arch happens when he's 12. He like the version that they see in like the book, at least version of the Aries fight is that people think that he's like on a beach fighting like his kidnapper with like a giant knife or whatever. And when he's like a 12 year old kid and it's like this whole international, like, you know, story, like you would imagine that would be. And so it makes sense why they would think that about him. But literally most of those stories start with them trying to arrest him because they think that he might be like a terrorist of some kind and they can never arrest him because he's Percy Jackson and he has powers. And it's really funny how there's one story in particular (laughs) that always makes me laugh because all like all of the Avengers eventually start trying to show up to arrest him because they all keep losing when they fight him and Annabeth and they don't understand why because it's like this is just two 18 year old kids why are you guys so bad at this and so they all start showing up and Annabeth and you know and Percy or Annabeth and Percy and so they're just they immediately can see where they are where they're hiding and they're like just come out already and they just like fight all of them and beat them and just walk away and they just keep telling them to leave them alone but that's like that's the whole thing with him is like it's so easy to look at kind of his life and his story and think that he's a bad kid when he's not at all and there's no way for him to really explain that to people yeah how do you it's just that whole impossible thing of if people think that you're a bad kid and there's anything at all where they could think that about you there's nothing that you can do really to convince them that you're not like no matter how much you try it like you just can't do anything you're just stuck with that and especially with stuff like that with schools and shit it's just like if the school thinks that you're a troublesome kid you're Mm -hmm. just done for like it reminds it reminds me of kids that i knew when i was in middle school and high school like i said before but that -hmm. stuff always makes me mad because i remember those kids when because I was always nice to those kids because we were a lot of the times in the same sort of position of nobody liked us, but we had to go to school every day and our parents also sucked. And so we were just kind of like, I remember my eighth grade social studies teacher was horrible. And there's this one kid in my class. I don't know what learning disability he had because I don't remember, but I just remembered that he would sometimes go to like the LD classroom, I would see him in there sometimes when I would be in there doing like my math tutoring and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And that teacher, though, he would be sitting in class, not doing anything, completely quiet. And she would just like call him out and kick him out of class. And it was bad to the point that the rest of us in class were like, what did he do wrong? yeah he's just sitting there he's not doing anything and it was just because he was like labeled as like a bad kid or whatever or because he had some sort of learning disability or what have you that she just would find any reason to kick him out of class and make him get up and leave and that whole thing was is so like embarrassing when that happens when you have to go to that then you have to go to the ld classroom and try to explain why they made you leave class and And it's like, there is no reason for why. And it's just, it's so hard to try to get through school already. And then on top of it, when you, like, this is ignoring the fact that Percy also has ADHD and dyslexia. And so like, even like, I thought one of the things that was funny when he was at school was that when the Canadians were around and they said like their name or, or he saw something with their name on it, he like, wasn't sure if it actually said that or if it was his dyslexia making him see something different than was actually there and it's like there's a million reasons for why school is so hard for him yeah i it, it's so funny because i know this wasn't my first time reading sea of monsters but like rereading it and forgetting that that's what happened i totally was like no you're not you don't have dyslexia that sounds like monster names like yeah <laughs> yeah and um but like on him missing that that little detail, I love that Tyson picks it out first. Tyson's just like those kids smell. Like yeah. something's wrong. They smell. Yeah. I love that too. I I love how the thing I always like about Percy Jackson stuff is that Percy, like we say a million times, 
feels like he needs to protect everyone and is always willing to sacrifice himself for everybody else. But that doesn't mean that his friends are, <laughs> won't like, will just like let him do that. And so I like how Tyson is like trying to protect Percy in his way of being like, there's something wrong with those kids. They smell bad. There's something off with them in like a different way. Even if he can't verbally say like they're monsters in that way, he just knows that something's bad. And even like when the whole reason why Annabeth like reveals herself is because one of them attacks Percy and yeah. she punches one of them like right in the face. And it's like, stay away from my friend. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, get away from him right now. <laughs> And yeah. it's just, I always like those parts that they add that in because it's like, yeah, it's really easy to make your hero self-sacrificing, but if you have them be real people, their friends are not going to just let them do that. Yeah, they'll be like, no, no, <laughs> you're not. I know what you're thinking, stop. <laughs> yeah, like we're going we're gonna to also protect you. You don't have to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, that's, it's why they're friends. Otherwise, I get so annoyed in stories like even fantasy, whatever ones like this, where they they don't have that stuff happen because it's like you guys are shitty friends. <laughs> you don't like that's that's my whole gigantic chip on my shoulder about Ron and Harry Potter, is that multiple times in those stories he he gets mad at Harry for the things that he has to do, and it's like, are you mentally damaged that your friend is like forced to join this tournament? and has to fight a dragon and you're like mad at him because you're jealous like do you want to fight a dragon <laughs> right and if all of the people to know how like dangerous dragons are his brother works at them like yeah hello. and also like to know your friend that harry by that book you know for sure harry doesn't want attention yeah, no yeah. like kid in that sort of situation wants attention we just want to be left alone Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to be the, like the main character. <laughs> we want to be left alone where we can just be one of the side, like literally it is so fun. I was talking to a friend of mine last night and I was, we were talking about how we identify, we like process things in our life through like the fiction stuff that we've watched. And we both have done that since we were kids. And, and I was saying like, yeah, uh, like Percy and like Luke Skywalker and all these like main character people, I always love them because they remind me of me and they act so much like me and I can like try to process the disaster of my life through like their, the way that they handle it or like figure out almost like what I even want out of life by like the things they have that I wish that I could have, things like that. And she's like, yeah, you do have like main character energy. And I'm like, I know this sounds like I'm a, being a main character, but I don't think that I do. <laughs> and that's like what all those main characters think. Like Percy constantly is like, why does anybody care about me? <laughs> like, why am I like, why am I the one? Like, I'm just going to, I'm going to be the prophecy kid because I want to, I, I, I'm not going to make a 10 year old child do it, but also and I, I, I'll just do it because it's the right thing to do. But it's, but he also genuinely doesn't understand why anybody cares about him. And it's in, in that way, like he doesn't see himself in that same way. Harry Potter doesn't either. He's just kind of like, I'm just here. What the fuck? <laughs> and, but it's that whole dynamic of like, I don't want to be the center of attention. I would actually be really happy to be like a side character that nobody actually looks at, but somehow that's never what I get to do in my life. <laughs> It's just the Leo experience, you know? <laughs> People think we're trying to get the center of attention, that we're trying to put all this drama on us. It comes our way sometimes. It's like, I really cannot help this one, sorry. I just, it's so funny to think about that stuff because because uh, my mom has so many Leo placements. Yeah. And I don't have any, but it is very much her, that's, that. yeah, that makes sense for her. <laughs> But it is like a, a whole thing with characters like that is we don't want that, but our like life experiences kind of force us to be in that position because it's like, who the fuck else has this experience? Yeah. Like who, who else, like with Harry Potter even, like who else is told from the age of 11 that he's going to be everyone's like Jesus savior because he didn't die when he was a baby. And everyone knows about his parents more in his family than he actually does. He doesn't know anything about anything. And the same kind of thing with Percy where like, 
even in this these chapters like people everyone else seems to have figured out that tyson is a cyclops and he has no freaking clue what's going on and i don't think at that point he's even met one before so i'm not even sure if he realized that tyson was like a monster of some kind if he even would understand what he actually was Mm -hmm. um because he's still like new to everything and is just trying to figure it all out and everyone else knows everything including his mother (laughs) telling him what's going on at camp well and i i love that like percy's whole thing is like yes this kid seems to be challenged but i i am too like Mm -hmm. and finding that camaraderie even though their their functional needs and their support needs are very different Mm -hmm. yeah it's like the the, you could call it like chronic illnesses or just like chronic problems, mm-hmm. disability stuff. It's kind of a necessary thing to find at least one person in your life that has something mm-hmm. similar to that because otherwise it's just like no one, I genuinely like spend, sometimes I spend time sitting there be, thinking of like, could I ever be friends with a normal person? <laughs> like someone who isn't neurodivergent in any way shape or form like um or had like a happy childhood i don't even know how to talk to somebody like that i i feel like we wouldn't talk i would just sit there and stare at them (laughs) because i wouldn't even know what to say to people like that like i feel like even more of an alien around people like that because it's like I don't, everything that I would say about literally anything that's ever happened to me at any aspect of my life for the entirety of my life would depress you. And so I feel like I should just not say anything. So I'm just not going to. (laughs) Yeah, with, with me, I like, I thought I had my one person that was like, no trauma, which is Jake, but his trauma just wasn't parent trauma. (laughs) Like, yeah, so even then it's like, oh, I just find people with different traumas. Mm Mm-hmm. And Jake's was like similar to like school stuff of just people just not getting him yeah. and the, just the regular way that people are supposed to live, just like not working for him. Mm-hmm. Even if you have like, maybe you're not neurodivergent or whatever school sometimes just still doesn't work for people no matter what. Yeah. Um, Cause they do try to like make you be a certain way. Like I would, I const- I just think it's so funny that I was able to get through all of school without anyone realizing that I had PTSD or autism or was going through horrible abuse at home. I just, it's so funny to me in a horrible way, but it's just funny that nobody figured out any of those things because I somehow could just like skate by at school, even though I failed, I failed every math class from fourth grade on. Yeah. I, I failed geometry three times. <laughs> Geometry is the devil. It is. I I was not a geometry person at all. I know they say you're either like geometry or algebra. Algebra makes more sense to me. Yeah, that at least I can at least like try to figure it. I can at least like see in front of me how like you're supposed to solve equations and things like that. But like geometry just doesn't make sense. Oh my god, I took it. I I yeah, I literally took it like three times. I took it in regular school and failed it. I took it in summer school and failed it again. I took it in summer school, like again, when I was in like college, when I had to take it again and failed it. Yeah. And the only time I passed it was when I took a high school class that was like doing geometry and advanced algebra. And so you had like two classes in a row instead of just like one. And so you went through everything quicker. Literally everyone in that class, all of us were like, I hate math. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And so that the teacher would let would like teach us differently because everyone was struggling with math and we needed to pass advanced algebra in order to graduate. And that I don't think I would have ever passed either of those unless unless I was in a class like that that let us like use our notes and things like that that any other class wouldn't let you do. Yeah. Um because it was just <laughs> It was like the class of like neurodivergent kids being like, oh my God, I just want to graduate high school. <laughs> Let me out of this stupid building. Yes. Math credits are the devil. Like, I don't understand why there's math credits at the college level either. There's there's usually a math requirement. I mean, a lot of times you could just get away with statistics, 
but mm -hmm. sometimes it's more than that and it's like why why right. i don't i don't know if it was like this for you but when i was in school even in college mm -hmm. um math class you had to get a c or better mm -hmm. in order to actually pass and like literally every other class ever even if you got like a d that was still seen as like passing mm -hmm. and so that was why i kept failing geometry 7000 times because i i remember like the last time that i took it when i was in college i was ready to just like give up on life because i got like a c minus and was like five percentage points away from passing but because it was a c minus and not a c i didn't pass and it was just like that's the only class like that every other class you can get a d and or d minus even and it's still seen as like passing and so it's like what why do i need to know math I am creative. I don't need to know math. I'm never going to like, I'm never going to use math ever again after this. This is like the last thing that I would ever want to take ever. Why mm -hmm. do I need to, why do I need to get a C in order to pass this stupid class? And if I can't do it, I can't graduate. Yeah. Even though I, by the time I graduated, I had like 20 credits over what I needed in like English and social studies because I was good at those classes. Mm -hmm. And they literally told me, they like, literally made me stop taking them. Yeah. <laughs> like my, my senior year when I met with like my guidance counselor, they like gave me, I'd had, I like worked for the guidance counselor office for like a credit from like my last semester, because I had taken so many like English and social study classes that they're like, you can't take more. So just sit in our office for the last period of the day. And if we need a little things done, you can do it. Otherwise it's basically like study hall and you get a credit for it. So you can graduate. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I I think I got to the point where I had extra elective credits at the, the end of high school. And so I was a TA for one period and I tried to take beginner French and being with the freshmen was awful. So I was just like, no. Oh my God. I'm remembering like trying to learn foreign languages. Yeah. Some if classes hadn't have been offered, I probably, I don't, I don't know if I would have gone French or Spanish because that's all that was offered at my high school. Mm -hmm. um, probably Spanish. And even then, like I took, a year and a half, maybe, maybe two of Spanish in college, still can't speak it. Mm -mm. I know there's like certain words that I still remember when I hear like, when I see like Spanish speaking people or whatever, but I could never speak it, especially now after so many years. But even back then I couldn't like speak it. Um, I remember when I was one of the class, one of the schools I went to for second and third grade, they taught like Spanish to us at that age, which is the actual age you should because kids that young can like learn things like that much quicker. Mm -hmm. And so I learned like a year or so of Spanish and knew a bunch of it and then, you know, lost it when I didn't take it again for another like three years until I was in middle school. And so I just kept taking Spanish <laughs> because you had to take a foreign language to graduate from high school. And so I just kept taking Spanish and trying to pass. And I did, you know, I did pass. It was definitely like interesting for a while there, but I did at least do it. It it never makes sense to me. Um, it's just too hard for, I think it's the autistic part of my brain is that it's just too hard to conceptualize that sort of stuff. It just doesn't make sense. I can't even imagine being somebody with like dyslexia, mm -hmm. trying to learn a foreign language yes. when foreign languages already don't make sense and on top of it already and then having to add more things to it it's like oh my god yeah. it already is so confusing and then to add on even more things that make it even harder to read like jesus christ yeah well i mean so in the show they give this detail of sally teaching percy ancient greek so <laughs> unrealistic i'm sorry i i have to call that one a bullshit on that one number one like Okay, reading it's going to be easier for him because of the half blood thing. But the way that the grammar works is so you know how you have to conjugate verbs in Spanish? You do that with nouns. And then you know how there's masculine and feminine with like different words, and you have to remember how to make the adjective agree with that. Well, there's three grammatical genders in Latin and Greek. There's a neuter. Wait, actually, I can't remember if there's a neuter in Greek now. I'm pretty sure there is. 
Um, but like you have three grammatical genders, you have declining is the word instead of conjugating. And um, doing that on the fly in your head, oh my gosh, like how, how did they do it? You know, how, like how? Yeah, like in this chap, one of the chapters, like Annabeth yells something at them in ancient Greek and Percy just says like he automatically just understands what she says. He yes. can't say it necessarily himself, but he basically, his brain just automatically translates it without him having to actually know it. Um, I'm curious if that kind of stuff will happen on the show or if they'll do the thing of like, because when he was on the show, at least when he was listening to his dad and Zeus talk, he only understood one word that he actually learned. The rest of it, he was just like, I don't, I don't know what you guys were saying. You just said the word dad. Yeah, I feel like it would make sense for him to recognize keywords and phrases, maybe, mm -hmm. like to have a few of those up his sleeve. But like hearing someone natively talk it, I, I feel like it makes more sense the way they're doing it in the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. I think that's why they're probably doing it in the show, especially because that would be hard <laughs> for like the kids to learn lines in ancient Greek. Like they'll all, they'll all probably say it at some point because there are scenes where they have kind of have to because it's important parts of the of the story but yeah i can imagine almost a more challenging thing than to because at least like in other things when you're ma when you're talking in like a made-up language at least it's like made up and you could just kind of figure out what it's supposed to say in your mind but no you're literally trying to speak a language that was spoken like thousands of years ago i mean the good thing for them is i I've heard that the pronunciation is extremely different. And so like, there wouldn't be people that speak Greek necessarily. Well, I mean, there, there still would be that asshole who's like, I speak Greek, that doesn't sound right. But um, you, you could also just be like, well, this is ancient vowel shift over time. I mean, English had a vowel shift too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the the whole cab part the gray sisters is that something that's in um greek mythology or did he make that up it is um they're not the fates they're different than the fates if i'm remembering mm -hmm. i don't remember exactly but like there's kind of a reoccurring motif of sisters of three <laughs> i feel like for some reason three is the number and I remember, I can't remember, there's some other like fantasy-ish thing that I've read before where, because the thing where they're like sharing one eye That's, and they're like yeah. fighting so, over who, oh, that reminds me of something else, but I don't know what it is. So in Hercules, they have the fates do it. The fates yes. all share one eyeball mm -hmm. and something else. They share an eyeball, some other physical feature. Um, but that's actually the Grey Sisters, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, like, one other thought that I have about Tyson is, as much as we have a as a society have moved away from the R slur being used so casually, I kind of hope that they still include Percy getting mad at Sloane for saying it. About I do Tyson. too, because there are kids out there that probably that still use it. Um, this really weird thing happened on TikTok a year-ish ago, maybe longer than that, sometime when I was on here, that some um, like teenage-ish kids were trying to say that, were wanting to say it again and be like, as like an idea of like, oh, we're like reclaiming this word. And it's like, no, like, no. <laughs> um no like please no like um ugh. i just remember so many people calling me that um including my sister she did it a lot um and so i really don't like that word at all and it just reminds me of all that kind of stuff my sister still uses that word oh yeah people who she still use it unironically she like said it i when i saw her like over this past week and when she said it, I just kind of looked at her like, are you seriously saying this word still? Like it, like I didn't, um, <laughs> I was like, I was like the kid that was like a 35 year old adult in my own head, but 
even back when I was in middle school and stuff, when people would say that word, I hated it. And mm -hmm. I would tell people not to, or I would try to like make fun of her whenever she would say it or whatever, or try to explain why she should stop. Um, but she still did anyway. And so I'm sure that there are still kids that say those sort of things, especially, especially on a show like this, where quite literally not exaggerating every single character is disabled yes. um that it feels like I, I hope that disney lets them say it especially because the way that it's phrased it's like a but it's so obvious of how bad you are as a person if you use that word and mm -hmm. if you're going to bring slurs like that up that's the way to frame them of showing kids like never say this under any circumstance it hurts people, it's harmful, it's a horrible thing to think about a person to call somebody something like that. And like, when you're a kid and you're watching a show like this, you don't want to be the one to make Percy upset. And so it makes them, it, it's an easy way for them to show that kids shouldn't say, say slurs, not even just that slur then, but like any of them. And we'll just, it's an easy way to kind of put something in to make kids watching this to like rethink when, because it's very easy, I remember, I remember a lot of the kids that said stuff like that to me and stuff like that in middle school, they would just kind of say it because of like peer pressure mm -hmm. at all that like the po other popular kids would say those words to the really unpopular kids. And so they would just kind of join in so that the, you know, the kids that were doing that stuff would leave them alone. And so it's easy, I think, when you're not autistic and don't understand hierarchies and reject all forms of peer pressure. <laughs> yeah. That's something that we do. Um, if you're not like that, and even if you are like that, but you like just really want to fit in. So you just like give into like those beliefs, even if you don't necessarily agree with them. It's, it's just really easy to do that. But a show like this could do something with that, at least bring it up that like, it's a really bad word to use to talk about other kids like that. And especially yeah. Um, like a couple months ago, <laughs> a couple months ago, I remember there was this asshole on Twitter that happens every once in a while that, and, and they get like re, they get like ratio to death where the responses and the retweets are way more than like the people who like what they said, which is basically what being um, ratioed means for anyone who doesn't know, know what that mm -hmm. means. Um, I had to explain this to my mother recently, so <laughs> this is why I'm doing this of like what being ratioed means. Um, I don't even know why my mom was asking me about that. <laughs> but anyway, um, he did this tweet that was trying to be like, trying to say like, oh, disability shouldn't be in like science fiction or fantasy. Um, because if you're in a, fit, in, in a fantasy world, shouldn't all disabilities go away? And it's like that horrible like eugenicist sort of idea of like in a fantasy world all everyone's problems would be solved and so there wouldn't be any sort of disabilities and so as part of like counteracting that very stupid statement people just started posting like retweeting that tweet and posting people that are like the heroes in science fiction fantasy things that are all disabled like luke skywalker is disabled he doesn't have one of his hands and it, that's a, actually a regular thing in Star Wars. <laughs> like Anakin's disabled, Luke is disabled. Um, there's some of the kids in like the new ones are too. I can't remember like if Rey or Finn are, one of them is, but I can't remember right now. But, but a lot of the posts during that were included Percy because it was like, hi, Percy has ADHD and dyslexia. Literally every single person that is a hero on the, literally every single one is Ever. disabled. Are you going to say that the kid who is a child of a god doesn't get to be a hero because he has disabilities because that's stupid yeah <laughs> but yeah in a show like this that was created by somebody who is advocating for the disabled kids i can't imagine that they would that they would shy away from making a point out of that yeah i mean like sometimes that comes off really cheesy so i'm thinking of a seventh heaven episode where um, <laughs> Yeah, like, um, so there was a Seventh Heaven episode where there's like the black version of the Camdens. Um, they're like all hosting them because their church got lit on fire or something. Of course. And, and so while they're out on the playground, someone says the N word to the the Simon equivalent, and <laughs> Simon gets in a fight with him. 
And because so it becomes a, oh, well, you were wrong for hitting him. I understand why you did it, but you shouldn't have hit him. It, it, it came off so cheesy or like, I don't remember if Disney Channel sponsored the commercial, but the one that people famously use is that um, Hillary Duff commercial. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or it's yeah. like, that's so girl who wears a skirt like a shirt. Yeah. <laughs> I just had like so many flashbacks to Seventh Heaven. Yeah. Right, the, the episode of Seventh Heaven I remember the most that I remember when I was younger watching it and being like, you guys kind of suck. Um, that I, of course, remember is the one when there's like a girl that is obviously a rape victim and their version of that because seventh heaven is a fucking joke is a girl like she's sitting on like a park bench and she has on like three layers of clothes like like three like jackets and three shirts and all this stuff and i'm like we don't do that <laughs> like we wear like baggy clothes but i don't need to wear 47 layers jesus christ yeah. and like one of the kids like of course befriends her and she's like not wanting to trust them and the, the insane thing about this episode is that they go through this whole thing of finding out that she's being like assaulted by probably her dad since i remember it and um and they go through this whole thing of her like trusting them enough after yelling at them for a while which is accurate to tell them what is going on and they basically like pray with her and they have her stay with them for like a night and then they just like have her leave and like no nothing changes and it's just okay what a great message that kids that are going through that we just look like hobos and wear 57 like layers of clothes and if you guys just t be nice to us for one day we'll immediately just tell you our entire tragic backstory and if you just give us dinner that night and give us some new clothes so and let us take a shower so we like look more presentable which is pretty much what happens to her then obviously obviously all the trauma just like goes away if we yeah, look yeah, like conventionally shower. attractive instead of like whatever we look like otherwise and but i don't think it would be anything like that i think honestly it would be like the scene itself in the book like the bullies saying calling them that and percy like you know yelling and telling telling them like never say that word to him ever again like he's not that at all um yeah. Because that is like the best way to show that without making a point out of it is to just show the natural like because that is honestly how those conversations actually go. in like middle school is like kids just kind of saying that to you to try to get a rise out of you and yeah. it, you either just say nothing or you get like Percy and protective of who they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And tell them to leave them alone and like one thing that is nice about Percy Jackson is that nobody ever says that to Tyson when they get to like camp and stuff like everybody loves Tyson like actually some of the other kids at camp are assholes to him at first and because they're afraid of him at first because they think that he's a monster um but then when they realize that this monster cries if you don't give him peanut butter sandwiches <laughs> and it is like a sweetheart that literally just runs around yelling Percy's name and gives him a big hug and um, cries whenever Percy looks upset because he doesn't want him to be upset and just is really good at building, um, he's really good at building like weapons and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. and that's basically what he does for the rest of the books. He even gets a girlfriend in later books and stuff. He's a, Aww. I love Tyson so much. He's so adorable, but he's just, just like a, like a sweet little like break for Percy that, um, he always loves him no matter what he always has something very nice to say he and just is never puts like anything on him and just mm -hmm. always loves him unconditionally in that way and doesn't and is like part of the stuff that's going on like he's part of the big battles and stuff but he doesn't ever make percy feel anything um he's one of the rare people that never guilt trips him over luke yeah in any of the books he just loves percy and is so excited about being his brother and yeah. And it is just like, I gave you a, let me build you a watch. I built you a watch that also has a shield in it so you don't die the next time you go out in battles. Because I, cause, cause Tyson is there when the whole like horrible Luke battle happens at the end of this book. He's <laughs> there and helps Percy get back to camp when he's all messed up and can't walk. So, um, so he sees all of that stuff and his response to it is, I'm going to go in like the mines and in like like Hephaestus's area 
and I'm going to learn how to make all these weapons. And he just kind of shows up every once in a while and gives some to Percy. Yeah. Whenever he needs a new weapon, he just goes and sees Tyson and he just gives him peanut butter. Oh. <laughs> and Tyson is is always so happy to see him. <laughs> yeah. And just ask him to bring him peanut butter. That's like the thing that he misses when he's not when he's not in like around like humans or whatever is peanut butter. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I, I also love peanut butter, so I get it. I wish I remember more of these details. I'm so excited to reread it. I do hope they also um that they choose somebody who has a disability for Tyson. Me too. Yeah. I just love I love that. Um I love the idea, especially because of it's just this show, like Rick Riordan making it, it being what it is. It's just very it's a very it's rare, I find, that a show in this way can very easily introduce an actor who has a disability playing a character that you could see as some sort of disabled. Mm -hmm. Usually it's harder, at least from what other people say, it's harder to introduce characters like that. Like people love Toph so mm -hmm. much in Avatar The Last Airbender because she is a disabled character that will absolutely stomp your face off. Like not, her disability is never seen as a bad thing. It's part of what makes her so powerful. And yeah. it's honestly a rare thing to see something like that. But on this show, like literally everybody is. And so if if Hollywood was actually going to cast a disabled person to play a disabled person, it would be this show. Yeah. Because everyone is disabled. So it's it's very it's normal um for them to do that. And it, it would be very simple. It wouldn't like cause like an uproar or whatever. Like there's like no risk to that mm -hmm. on on a show like this where everybody has multiple disabilities. Um, yeah. No matter how smart they are, they all have ADHD and dyslexia. So it's like it's in and, and the way that Hollywood usually uses for not having disabled actors play those roles. It doesn't actually it doesn't apply um on this show it just doesn't make sense yeah well and i mean we've already seen them wreck it once they're not going to go that bad again <laughs> like mm -hmm. i i ha still haven't watched the full thing of sea of monsters logan lerman movie but the oh fact God. like after you said it i had to see and <laughs> part of me wants to like so the newest olympian is uh one of the percy jackson podcasts like i posted some of our videos with clips from that um, podcast because uh, Walker did an episode that episode actually is really funny with Walker on it because the host was like made like a joke like if oh if Walker Scovell is ever on my show I'm going to just act like he's a normal guest and just analyze whatever chapter from like whatever from one of the heroes of Olympus books that I'm reading and not acknowledge that he's <laughs> that he's Percy and that's what he does like the like the first half of the show they just are analyzing like a chapter three of the lost hero. And there's like one part where they're talking about something and Walker starts saying, oh, we should. And he's like stops and like coughs. And he's like, they should add it in because he's trying to act like he's not in the show. It's really funny. Oh and then it just, and then he, he like literally is like, oh, so what's your connection to Percy Jackson? And Walker is like, he gets to like very nonchalant be like, oh, I just played like a small role in the show. You know, I, I'm, I read the book seven times and, and I, I'm, I played Percy Jackson. He's like, oh, I thought I recognized you. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. Um, but the, the guy who does that show is fun because he didn't read the books until he was in his thirties. And so he's reading all the books for the first time talking mm -hmm. about things. I want to go back and listen to him because he says that he is like the an most anti Luke podcast. And the thing that has stopped me from listening to any other like popular Percy podcast that I've run into that has like interviewed people who are involved in the show is because they say things about that are like, defending Luke and I'm like nope goodbye I don't want to hear any of that I literally it it honestly like makes me anxious hearing people try to make excuses for somebody like Luke because it just scares me about the kind of stuff that people let slide in like actual life if they are making excuses for this sort of character um but he doesn't which makes me want to listen to it but anyway he has a bunch of episodes where he watches Sea of Monsters and he, and just like 
talks about how insane it is and like rips it apart and there's even a couple episodes in there where they read through like the original script for the lightning thief that is even worse than the lightning thief movie like i remember the thing like in the description for those episodes i saw on spotify he was saying that um that like the original script for the lightning thief grover is like super fucking horny for some reason he keeps talking about like literally saying i'm so horny right now (laughs) it's like why why oh my god but um i remember one of those like tiktok videos i saw when the show first came out and people were like making fun of the movie versus versus the show one of those i saw somebody it was like one of those like ones where they just had like the words on the screen and they were saying like sometimes i sit back and remember that in the sea of monsters movie chronos eats luke and i was like what he eats yeah. him he i need eats him <laughs> and she was just like i swear i like i believe you because those movies are so bad but like what <laughs> like why would they do that that's hilarious it's like well Chronos eats his kids in the mythology so like of course yeah Kronos eats him <laughs> that's like a bad example because we've talked about how in the show they changed they changed to Festus's um amusement park mm-hmm. and they changed it by incorporating a different myth mm-hmm. and that was perfect that was done so well mm-hmm. but it sounds like they tried to do that and just failed at it (laughs) i just i don't even i like i go back to what i said before that in the lightning thief movie it's the summertime and um persephone is just in the underworld in the summertime when she's not supposed to be there and that's like the most basic thing and it's like how do you get that that (laughs) besides like whatever the other stuff the other like one of those TikToks that like I just die laughing whenever I see them is um where they were comparing like what the movie and the show did for um Grover seeing um his uncle Ferdinand at Medusa's Mm -hmm. and they show like the whole long scene in the tv show where they're all where he's sad and they're sad and they like are trying to console him and and all this kind of stuff and he's like you know gets himself together and the version from the from the movie is literally grover walking up and being like oh you look like my uncle the end that's the only thing that's part of it in the movie and i'm just like it like honestly scares me um because i've heard something about how the second movie like tries to set up percy and clarice like romantically and i'm like I didn't get that from at least the first 10 minutes that I watched. Ew! (laughs) Like, sorry, that's just like such a weird, like, ugh. Like, Clarice, no. Like, not in that way. Like, Clarice is great. Like, she has her own people, but that's... Mm -hmm. It's not Percy. Yeah. (laughs) Just like, and it's just like, how did you guys get there? Like, how did you... Like, no wonder, like, the the old tweets from Rick Riordan still make my entire life of him talking about those, when people would ask him about those movies, and him just being like, why would I know? Like, no, I have never seen them before. Yes, I hate them with every fire, fiber of my being. Yes, I'm very grateful that they stopped after the second movie, because it, like, brought me great pain in my life, and... And I hated every second of what they did and was literally just saying like he would watch, he would hear about it and just be like, how did you get that from that? And it's like seeing these, seeing these clips just makes some of that like hit home of like, yeah, how did they do that? Like, how did you, how did you have Kronos eat Luke (laughs) in the second book and Clarice and Percy are the people that have romantic undertones? Yeah, no, no reason. And like, why is like, in that one scene you sent me, why is like Poseidon and, I didn't even realize who like Sean Bean was. Like, I thought that he was Zeus, but he's not, he's somebody else. But it's like, why are they like weirdly tall? And like, why does Poseidon move like as if he is made of water? Like, like a weird water bender? <laughs> I don't even know. 
besides like the weird conversation he has with Percy of like, oh yeah, I was around for the first seven months of your life and then I arbitrarily decided to just leave. And the reason why none of us can see our kids is because they decided that us loving you was like too problematic. And I was just like, why would you change like like the basic things like that in the story that you don't need to? Like, is there, there's legitimately no point in making anything Percy Jackson related if they're not kids. And then also on top of it, their parents have a magical out for why they're neglectful and abusive parents. Yeah. So I'm like, so why, why are we here? <laughs> yes. I don't even know. I, I, part of me wants to watch it, but I think that I would actually like lose my mind watching it and start screaming. <laughs> it's one of those things you have to hate watch, I'm sure. Just like <laughs> Twilight, you know, where you turn your brain off a little bit. <laughs> It's so funny, like watching epi uh, episodes, watching interviews. For some reason, whenever Walker would get interviewed, they would ask him if he watched the movies, which he did because he was a literal child. Yeah. Um, like one of them came out when he was one year one years old. So I'm sure that those movies were movies like those childhood movies that you watch like a million times that yeah. have like that whole nostalgia thing that are probably bad movies, but you don't care. Um, but whenever they would ask him about those movies, he would he he would sum it up very well of being like, oh, yeah, I watch those movies and I like them and I still like them. And he, the way he always put it is like our show is a little bit more accurate, though. And I was like, oh, you think? <laughs> and yeah. like the comment section would always be like underselling of the century by the way he talks about the movies versus the show. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I'm trying to think, like, the one example I have where the book is vastly, vastly different than the movie, but I don't really remember the details too much, was Queen of the Damned. Oh. And, yeah, so that one, I remember loving the movie for what it was because, you know, it was, it was sexy. It was like that era, that couldn't have been that long after The Mummy, but it was one of those yeah. movies where, like, the entire, the entire cast was hot, like, mm -hmm. male and female. And so if you were a bisexual in that era, Queen of the Damned was your shit. Doesn't matter that it was not true to Anne Rice. But um, yeah, like I, I feel like Logan Lerman's iconic enough that like it, it works in that sense. But yeah, if you're taking this at all as a Percy Jackson movie, it's not. No, I saw Queen of the Damned back then because I liked I loved Aaliyah and I was super depressed when she died. I remember that that movie came out after she died and so i think yeah, it came out in like 2001 or 2002. i can't remember if she even got to do any press events for it maybe mm -hmm. like a few but she like... pretty much she died like way before it ever even came out um okay. but that's why i remember that one of my friends liked Anne rice things and i don't remember if he liked the movie or not um i didn't read any of her stuff Though I never found the vampires that interesting. Um, so I didn't read those when I was growing up or anything. But um, yeah, I do remember that. But I, but at the time I was just like, yeah, that was fine. Because I don't have any, like, um, anything to do with, like, the book or anything like that. Or care if it's different necessarily. Yeah. Um, I wonder if these kids that are just getting into Percy Jackson, if they'll watch it. Because... Like, for example, William got into Avatar around the time it had its revival, you know, like mm -hmm. where it was put on Netflix and they started mm -hmm. talking about the live action and stuff. And um, he just knows by reputation that the, the live action movie, the one that came out a while ago, that that is trash. And so on principle, he's like, yeah, no, we're not, we're, I'm not ever going to. So I wonder, there's got to be some Gen Alphas doing the same thing with Percy Jackson of like, eh, I don't want to watch those movies. I feel like they'll like probably turn it on out of like curiosity mm -hmm. and then like 10 minutes into it be like, why is Percy like 30 years old? <laughs> Even though Logan Lerman was 18 years old when he like played that role, it's yeah. still like he's way too old um, yeah. that even the other stuff doesn't like them not looking accurate or whatever it's just like the personalities of all of them are like two different like i feel like that that one TikTok that somebody made where they're comparing what they did in like the show versus 
the book versus the show versus the movie for when they were at Medusa's, it was like the book version was that they use like, um, like their intelligence and they use like, it was like iPods back then. Mm -hmm. They use like the reflection from the iPods to see her and cut her head off without having to actually look her in the eye. Um, the show version is, you know, that um, they put like Annabeth's hat on her and so Percy just cuts her head off where he's not able to see her and they use her head to kill the other Fury thing without having to look her in the eye. But it's the same general idea of like using their intelligence and their strategy to figure it out. And then the the movie version is Annabeth isn't even there for some reason. She's outside in a car driving with her eyes closed. Yeah. And Percy literally just like walks up and like finds like a cell phone and just uses the cell phone camera and just does it with nobody else's around. He just does it on his own and doesn't even know what he's doing. And and like, then they have to go find like Grover and Annabeth for some reason drives a car into the wall um, yeah. when they're trying to get out. And it's just like that, those sort of differences of like, you can change certain things, that's fine. Like the show changes things. And it's fine if the general idea behind these things are still there. And so like it doesn't matter that they changed the stuff in the medusa scene because the general idea of showing that percy and annabeth and grover are intelligent and they're coming up with multiple plans and like working through not getting along together yeah but figuring out those plans that is the point of that scene having percy just like walk up and find a random cell phone and and kill medusa before he even realizes what he's doing yeah is like so it honestly makes me wonder what happened to the monsters. Yeah. Like, like, does he turn into a hamster? Does he turn into like a giant bear instead of a hamster or something? Or does somebody else turn into a, a random animal? And does he like kill um, Polythemus when he's like a rabid bear instead of a real person? Or, or, or does like polythemus get like does like grover kill him and cut his head off i don't even know yeah but who knows what actually happens like people who watch the movie know but i'm like honestly weirdly like curious and also scared to find out yeah i, I kind of want to finish it now yeah i just like the Logan lerman being stuck with like those movies um i i think that now that the show it has happened and people have kind of been able to move on that they'll leave it because it was it was a whole weird thing before the show came out that even in the run-up to the show coming out that a lot of interviewers would ask walker if he like heard anything from logan and he would have to say he didn't mm -hmm. um that like logan sent him like a like a dm or something at some point but um and basically yeah, said, like, the torch. like said basically like tell him to to get used to eating like blue food all the time but he ba he was not being like mean but he literally just said like i feel like i don't need to say anything to him because he's a good actor but it was just kind of one of those weird things of like people wanted them to like talk about what it's like to play this role but like logan was like i don't know what it's like to play this role because i wasn't really percy jackson <laughs> and so he has like nothing to say um, so that was always awkward when they would ask him about that because he would have to say that he had, like never had a real conversation with him about it at all. Um, and also it would be an absolutely absurd like Walker who had read the book six times by the time that he was 13 years old needs yeah. anyone alive to tell him what it's like to be Percy Jackson. No, I don't think so. I think he's good. I yeah. think he's more than good. Like this child like reads the book scenes before he does scenes of the show to like yeah. remind himself of what Percy is thinking about. So he thinks about those things when he films the scene. Like he doesn't need somebody to tell him what it's like to be Percy. I think oh, everything really? is fine. <laughs> like, but it's just like that whole idea of people were awkward about it. They like wanted Logan to play like Poseidon or something or be somebody in the show. And I'd like, no, just like, let it be, just let it be what it is and not like try to bring him into it like at least logan has um perks of being a wallflower yeah um, i haven't ever actually watched that movie because it will make me cry for 70 years i haven't watched it either or read the book um oh my god i i love that book so much um there is a big trigger warning with that book though but uh 
that was a wild experience to have like read that book before I knew that. But when I was, how old was I? Um, I think when I was a senior in high school, I took this, my favorite class of all time um, when I was a junior was modern lit. So I think I was a junior when I read it and it was a little, it was the easiest class in the world. I would have taken it if they would have let me my senior entire senior year too. But all you do in the entire class is you just read a book and you go to class and talk about certain chapters for like a, and then at, after you're done with the book, you just write, you get one of those like blue essay books and the teacher would just say like, talk about whatever about the book, like have something about it. And as long as you like used examples from the book to explain like your reasoning, you would get like, I had like the biggest A plus in the entire world in that class. Cause all I had to do was read a book and then talk about what I thought about it. And part of that class, we had to read Perks of Being a Wildflower. And I was really interested in reading it because it was one of the books that um, some parents were trying to get uh, banned. Mm -hmm. um, I'm honestly curious if people are still trying to ban it because part of that book is yeah, somewhere. Uh, Charlie, Charlie's the kid in the book and he, um, there's a, a friend of his that, oh God, I sorry, I just remembered who plays his friend in the movie that I don't think I can watch the movie now. It's what's his face. Um, the guy who played the Flash who, who like kidnapped like uh, something indigenous kids um, and yeah. got away with it. That, that actor guy who was like terrorizing Hawaii last year. I just realized that he plays his friend, so I probably shouldn't watch that movie. Um, but that sucks that he plays him in that movie. But anyway, um, that friend, that person who plays his friend in the movie, he is gay and he's like secretly hooking up with like somebody on the football team, but it's all a secret. And Charlie sees them do it and to try to make him feel better about the horrible thing of having to hide that he's gay and the person that he's with hiding it, their entire relationship and all that. He lets him kiss him just not because he is gay himself, but he just feels really bad for him and just wants to help in some way. And that's his way of like trying to comfort him and help him feel better. And like in my mind, that like makes sense to me for somebody to do something like that, to like try to comfort their friend in some way and just kind of let them do that in a way where they can feel better without feeling like all these strings and whatever. And that's like the scene from those from that book that um, a lot of parents get upset about. And it's like, he's not even gay himself. He's just trying to comfort his friend that is gay in high school when it's impossible to be gay when you're in high school, especially during those years. Um, yeah. But the, the book is really good because it's him like Charlie, like writing letters to somebody that he just calls it like dear friend. Mm -hmm. And he's I think he's like a freshman or sophomore in high school and he just doesn't know how to talk to people. He's like trying to be friends, but he doesn't know how to really talk to anybody. He's like the weird kid and um, just trying to like figure out how to do things. And there's a lot of things that he doesn't understand about himself and he doesn't know why. And then at the, the very end of the book, you find out or by him, realizing it is he realizes that the aunt that he mentions in the book a bunch of times he mentions in the book being sad that his aunt died and mm -hmm. that and saying positive things about her and stuff like that and then at the end of the book you find out that she sexually abused him and it's a total shock and like and he is shocked like charlie is shocked and it, he like goes in he literally like goes into shock and it doesn't like doesn't move for like hours on end um, when he remembers it because he's but it's one of those things that all the things that he struggles with with like romantic relationships and all that kind of stuff like makes sense once you realize that that happened to him and like he kind of accidentally blows up his friendship group he reminds me a lot of an autistic kid too because like the big scene from that book is he's at like a party and there's a girl Sam that plays is played by Emma Watson in the mm -hmm. movie that he like loves and he's but she's dating another guy and so he's dating this other girl um and they're playing like you know like truth or dare or something like that mm -hmm. and the thing that he gets is to kiss the prettiest girl in the room and he kisses Sam mm -hmm. and instead of the girl that he's actually dating 
Oh gosh. And it like literally like destroys their entire friendship group. And he doesn't understand what he did wrong. He's like, but that's what I do think. I didn't want to lie. And that just reminds me of so much of that sort of stuff. But it like me reading that when I was in high school, oh my God. Like I, uh, I found that book again last year. Um, my aunt bought it for me and I went back to read the end of the book because I genuinely did not remember what happened at, at mm -hmm. like after the reveal. I just never remembered what happened after that. Yeah. And, and I like, remember, I loved that book. Like I, it was literally like a, um, like a, almost like a stuffed animal, like a comfort thing. Like I brought it to college with me. Mm -hmm. Um, one of my friends would like, I gave it to I gave a copy of it to one of my friends to read because I was constantly talking about how good it was and how everyone needed to read it. She would make jokes. This girl is kind of an asshole, but she would make jokes to me about how she accidentally like spilled food or something on it. Because every time she said that, I would freak out because of how much I loved the book. And then she would be like, oh, I'm just kidding. And I would just be like, what the hell? I would be like so relieved that she was joking that I wouldn't even get upset. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I really loved that book. And like, when I finally got it again, like last year, I read the end. And the end of it is like what you want, like, he, he like tells his parents what happened, and they believe him and they have him go to like a, um, like a hospital and like get help for a couple months. And then he comes back the next school year, and is able to like, you know, you feel better and he feels better mm -hmm. about him being able to be in school and like find friends and like be more of himself now. Yeah. And of course, young me, like teenage me, I remember reading that and like literally sitting in my room in the dark for hours, like staring at the wall, <laughs> like crying or trying to cry. Most of the time I couldn't do it back then. Um, but really wanting to, because I was just like, that's what I want. Like, I want somebody to do that. And that did not happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, for another 26 years pretty much like I was 17 when I read that and I and I didn't get help until I was 34. Oh wow yeah so like I, at that age I knew that I needed help I desperately wanted help I like wanted it so bad I knew that I needed so much help but nobody would get me help and so yeah. I knew it and I just wanted so bad to have it but that's like that's why I've never watched that movie. And now I can't because asshole face is the friend in the movie. Um, but Logan Lerman does a really good job. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a few scenes of him being Charlie. Like he does a really good job showing um, like Charlie's realization and him like just breaking down because he does like, and that's kind of what that is like. Like he, like his parents find him in his room, like naked, like staring at the wall for, and he is like catatonic. Like he, they like, can't get him to respond to anything to anybody for days. Um, yeah. and that's the kind of, ex that's honestly what it's like when those things like pop up in your head, especially if you really have no idea that it happened. Um, yeah. I'm not funny enough. <laughs> like Walker Scopel with all of his fucking Saturn placements. He watched Perks of Being a Wallflower, and it's one of his favorite movies. And oh. I was like, this would be this would be one of your favorite movies. He said it was a funny story, but he said that he when he was going home after finishing filming Percy Jackson, I was like, this is the movie you watch when you're going home after spending 10 months filming Percy Jackson with a bunch of kids that became like people that you think are friends. <laughs> at least you, at least you think there might be your friend. Um, is a movie about like because it's really honestly about like friends and the people that like help you like realize who you really are and things like that um mm -hmm. he said he watched it on like the first flight he had home and like was like sobbing on the plane <laughs> and oh. then watched it again on the second flight home and cried again <laughs> he's so sweet yes that's like his he has the same um Venus sign as me, which is Pisces. And yeah, that's what we do. We're very creative minded people. And we just, we just like openly sob in the middle of like an, of an, two different airplanes because a movie like touches us. And we're like, I want to watch that again. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's exactly what we do. Yeah. But that, yeah, I loved that story. Cause I was like, yeah, that's of course. And like, of course, 14 year old you in eighth grade watched that movie. <laughs> 
yeah. that is like su that surprises you with that sort of an ending i don't think 14 year old him probably knew how that ending happened but i remember that was like a whole thing like for that book is like a thing for sexual abuse survivors is that of that reveal um mm -hmm. i remember when i first started going to therapy i found this podcast because i would like search the internet for anyone who's ever talked about incest and i found this podcast of somebody who went through that from like their older sister and was talking about it and he said that he watched that movie without knowing the ending and yeah like that that's what happened he had like flashbacks for days and weeks after that and i'm like yeah that's yeah <laughs> that's why like it's good that people are more aware of trigger warnings now and they like will tell you like um there are, i know there are movies with sexual scenes like that in them and i just avoid reading about them like i still don't know what happens in saltburn <laughs> oh yeah because <laughs> you told me don't even look into it i was like okay it's more gross out than it is i, I, mean, I know little... that it's gross but like that stuff just like it just gets in my head and then it just makes me think of other gross stuff so i just don't want to deal with it yeah totally understandable that the video of Aryan watching it was good enough for me because he looked traumatized by it <laughs> yeah. the videos of people watching it tell you everything you need to know mm -hmm. and just like the way that people would like reference it it's like when call what is that movie call me by your name mm -hmm. came out and people would like reference weird things and i was like this has to be a sex scene because why else would are you talking about this in this way and i till to this day i don't know what they mean and i'm never going to find out you can't make me <laughs> <laughs> like I refuse. <laughs> yeah. I I actually have to start wrapping up for time, but like okay, so we talked through chapter three, so we can talk talk another couple chapters next week. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of hoping there'll be news. <laughs> I'm hoping there'll be more news, maybe a casting release. That would be great. Because if they're starting to film in on August first there's usually a month or so of the cast um like training and stuff for like sword fighting or for this one it would probably be a bunch of people doing like underwater training again uh, like walker's obviously done some leah did a little bit but like anyone who would be like in the water at all or near it would have to go through that and a lot more of them are going to be in this in this season yeah. so they'll likely be in canada by like the beginning of july and mm -hmm. so it would make sense for the show to start announcing those things because the new cast members will have to do like totally new training like none of them have learned how to sword fight or fight or any of that stuff at all yeah so hopefully hopefully yeah, yeah. and i just uh, want to know who baby tyson is gonna be i just want to know who tyson's gonna be yeah, it was, if they release that one by next, oh, that would be perfect. But it'd be also nice to see who's going to be some of the gods that we haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. Or Thalia. Oh, man. Yeah, that one I'm sure they're going to save to the very end because it's literally the ending unless they decide to do flashback scenes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we will talk a little bit more sea monsters and whatever news comes out next time. Okay. All right, bye. Bye.